advising the king even after death. In an absolute monarchy, there needs to be officials who can limit the king's power, advise him to avoid bad policies, and encourage him to do good things. However, sometimes a king may refuse to listen, and an advisor might persist in their efforts right up until their death, and even use their death to continue their counsel. Such deep and enduring commitment is truly commendable. For example, Kuban Gok was a wise man whom King Lin Kong of the Wei State did not utilize. Di Tu Ha, on the other hand, was not competent, yet the king employed him. Sun Gu, seeing this, advised the king many times, but the king did not listen. When Sun Gu was dying, he told his son, As an official at the Wei court, I could not promote Ku Ban Gok or dismiss Di Tu Ha. If my advice cannot influence the king, then do not perform a full funeral for me. Just leave my body under the window and that will fulfill my duties. After he died, his son did as instructed. King Lin Kong, surprised by this, heard the will of Sun Gu and felt remorse. He ordered that Sun Gu's body be brought inside for proper burial rites. Indeed, after this, King Lin Kong promoted Ku Ba and Gok and dismissed Di Tu Ha. Confucius, upon hearing this story, commented, In ancient times, once advisors died, their roles ended, but Sun Gu used his death to advise the king, moving him to take action. Wasn't that truly loyal? Conclusion In an absolute monarchy, advisors are crucial to limit and guide a king's power. If advising fails, the advisor's role seems futile, but if they persist even in death, like Sun Gu, or dedicate their lives to their duties, like Dr. Bergo, who donated his body for medical research, they set a shining example for all to follow. 2. Maintaining Simplicity and Integrity The Story of Empress Dowager Bo and Emperor Liu Hang In the U.S., it's common for young people stepping into society to easily pick up bad habits due to their limited experience. In contrast, those who are more seasoned tend to be steadier and more resilient. Therefore, it is important for individuals to maintain a simple and straightforward character, to act cautiously, and to be flexible and accommodating to ensure their safety, while also being generous enough to preserve their natural simplicity and openness. Emperor Liu Heng of the Western Han Dynasty in China was known for his frugality. He was the fourth son of Emperor Gaozu, Liu Bang, and Empress Dowager Bo, who came from humble beginnings. Her mother was given to a man claiming to be a king during a peasant uprising at the end of the Qin Dynasty. After Liu Bang defeated this man, Empress Dowager Bo was captured and sent to weave in the royal palace in Chang'an. During a visit to the weaving area, Liu Bang was struck by her beauty and brought her into his service. She later gave birth to Liu Heng. In the tenth year of Gao Zhu's reign, 197 BC, when rebels allied with the Xiongnu challenged Han authority, Liu Bang personally led his troops to quell the rebellion and appointed the eight-year-old Liu Heng as a prince. Empress Dowager Bo was known for her gentle and graceful demeanor, never offending anyone and not seeking power. She focused on caring for her son and preferred a peaceful life. Thus, after the death of Liu Bang, even though the new regent was brutal and power-hungry, she did not harm Bo, allowing her to accompany her son to die, where she was honored as the Grand Empress Dowager. 3. Revenge One person sought revenge for his father and another for his country. These two deep-seated grudges, relentlessly pursued until satisfaction was achieved, were deemed truly justified, earning respect from all who heard of them. The states of Ngo and Viet were at war. King Hap Lu of Ngo was defeated and killed by the Vietnamese army. His son, Phu Sai, succeeded him and vowed to avenge his father's death. To keep his resolve, 
Fu Sai had a man stand in the courtyard to remind him whenever he came and went, shouting, Fu Sai, remember, the Viet killed your father. Have you forgotten? Fu Sai would reply, No, I dare not forget. Three years later, Fu Sai indeed defeated Viet and avenged his father. When Viet was defeated, its king, Cao Tian, sent envoys to seek peace. Despite the peace, Cao Tian was constantly distressed and worried to the point of despair. He made his bed from logs and hung a gallbladder in front of his seat, looking at it when he lay down and tasting it while he ate. He himself farmed and his wife wove fabric, living a hard-working life like ordinary citizens. He valued wise and talented people and helped those in need. For over twenty years, this was his way of life. Eventually, Cao Tian, having secured the loyalty of his people, launched a successful attack on Ngo, which led to victory for Viet. Commentary Seeking revenge, whether for one's father or country, when pursued with a sincere heart until it is achieved, is considered truly justified and commands respect. If Fu Sai and Cao Tian had faced such painful circumstances without showing any signs of emotion, they would be no better than stones, devoid of any sense of shame. Having a sense of shame is essential. It is what allows one to cleanse oneself of dishonor. After clearing this dishonor, it's crucial to remain vigilant and, most importantly, to transform and support those enemies who have stepped back or surrendered to alleviate their suffering and improve their status, thus ensuring lasting peace. If one becomes arrogant after clearing their shame and forgets to be cautious, they will only bring dishonor upon themselves and perpetuate endless mutual destruction. 4. Keep a pure heart, conceal your talents. The heart of a noble person should be as clear and pure as daylight without any hidden secrets. Their talents, like a precious gem, should be kept hidden and not casually shown off to others. One of Confucius's students, Zi Gong, always publicly admitted his mistakes whenever he made them. Some disagreed, saying, Isn't that a bit too much? If you make a mistake, just fix it yourself. Why the need to admit it publicly? Zi Gong replied, The mistakes of a noble person are like the sun and the moon, seen by everyone. To a noble person, errors are just a minor part of their overall character and a brief phase in their life's process. There's nothing that others don't see and nothing to fear. Moreover, by sharing my mistakes, my teacher and peers can help me correct them more quickly and thoroughly. I truly believe this deep in my heart. 5. Devotion to One's Country Nguyen V decided to harm the king because his father was wrongly killed, intending to cause the kingdom to fall. He prioritized loyalty to his father over loyalty to his king. While his intentions can be praised for his dedication to his father, they are also worthy of criticism for endangering his country. Bao Tu, on the other hand, aimed to save the nation by using only his tears and cries, showing extreme patience and resilience during desperate times. His actions moved those who initially did not intend to help, demonstrating his profound loyalty and love for the king and the country. King Bin of the So Kingdom executed General Ngui Sha based on slander, and Ngui Sha's eldest son also suffered harm. Ngui Sha's second son, Ngu Yen Vai, left So and became a general in the neighboring Nango kingdom. Before leaving, he visited his friend Bao Tu, a high-ranking official, and predicted, If So does not fall within three years, I will not see you again. Bao Tu responded, If you cause So's downfall, I must ensure it survives. Three years later, Ngu Yen Vi led Ngo forces to attack So King Chu, succeeding King Bin, fled to the mountains. While hiding in the mountains, Bao Tu heard of Ngu Yen Vi's tyranny and sought aid from the Qin Kingdom, explaining that the strong and numerous Ngo forces were threatening the world, starting with So. The king of Qin, King Ai, 
After seeing Bao Tu's seven days of continuous, heartfelt crying in his courtyard, decided, a kingdom that has such loyal servants must be helped. He then sent his army to aid So, prompting the Go forces to retreat, and thus So was saved. King Chu resumed his throne and wanted to reward Bao Tu, but he had already disappeared. Before leaving, Bao Tu stated, Borrowing troops and securing peace are not for personal gain. Now that the country is stable, what more should I seek? Conclusion Nguyen V's choice to prioritize filial loyalty over loyalty to the king is both commendable and questionable. Bao Tu's method of saving the nation, using only his tears and cries, highlights his extreme endurance and dedication. More commendable is that he sought no reward for his significant achievements, reflecting a virtue of doing good for the nation's sake, finding satisfaction in the act itself rather than seeking personal benefits. 6. Looking beyond the surface, thinking of oneself after death. A person who upholds morality may sometimes feel lonely, but those who rely on power and prestige will end up in a perpetual state of desolation and solitude. A generous and understanding person thinks about their eternal reputation after death, preferring to endure temporary loneliness rather than resort to flattery to avoid eternal misery. Badi and Shu Qi were the sons of the king of the Kotruk state during the Shang dynasty. The king of Kotruk wanted Shu Qi to succeed him. After the king's death, Shu Qi offered the throne to his elder brother, Badi. Badi refused, saying, This is our father's will, and then left. Shu Qi also refused to take the throne and left. The people then crowned another son of the king. After leaving, the brothers heard that Zibak Xiang, also known as King Wen of Zhou, was a virtuous man and decided to go to the state of Zhou. By the time they arrived, Zibak Xiang had passed away and King Wu had ascended the throne. When King Wu went to war against King Zhou, Ba Di and Xu Qi blocked his way, protesting, You go to war without burying your father. Is this filial? As a vassal state, is it humane to kill a king? One of King W.U.'s ministers wanted to kill the brothers, but Kuang Tu N.H.A. intervened, saying, These men value righteousness, and allowed them to go elsewhere. King Wu conquered Shang and established the Zhu dynasty. Ashamed of King Bu's actions, Ba Di and Shu Qi decided not to eat the grain of Zhou. They lived as hermits on Thuyang Mountain, surviving on wild fruits and vegetables, and eventually died of hunger. Their loyal actions are praised by later generations. 7. The Fox That Borrowed the Tiger's Power This story, similar to the fable The Donkey in Lion's Skin, emphasizes how some people use the authority of those above them to bully and intimidate others. King Tu Yen Vuong ruled the state of So. His servant, Chu He Tuat, was just a simple man, yet his name struck fear in everyone who heard it. Curious, the king one day asked his ministers why this was so. No one could answer him. Only Jiang Yi knew and explained. Tigers normally hunt other animals for food. One day, a tiger caught a fox. The fox warned, Don't touch me, or you'll die instantly. I am sent by heaven, and I have the authority over all creatures. Anyone who eats me will defy heaven's will and meet immediate doom. The fox then suggested, Let me walk ahead and you follow. See if any creature dares not to flee upon seeing me. Believing the fox's words, the tiger followed, and indeed, all animals fled at their sight. The tiger didn't realize that it was him they feared, not the fox. Today, King Tuyen Vuong, though powerful and with many soldiers, has given all his power to Xu He Tuat, and people in the north fear Tuat. But actually, they fear the king, just like the animals feared the tiger. Commentary just like the donkey and lion's skin, 
This story highlights how people can be deceived by those who misuse power to appear threatening. However, once people see through the deception, not only do they lose respect, but they also treat the deceivers with contempt to express their disdain. 8. Don't hate the petty. Don't fail to respect the noble. It's not hard to act sternly with those who are petty, but the challenge is not to hate them. It's also not difficult to respect those who are morally upright, but the real challenge lies in maintaining proper respect for them. During the Southern and Northern dynasties, Emperor Liang Wudi had a loyal subject named Trin Thu Thuk. One day, Trin's brother, Trin Thuk, unexpectedly visited, claiming he came to see his brother but was actually planning to assassinate Liang Wudi. Trin Thu Thuk, torn by loyalty to Liang Wudi, confided his brother's murderous intent to the emperor. Liang Wudi found himself in a dilemma. Ignoring it posed a danger to himself, yet taking action against Trin Thuk would betray Trin Thu Thuk's loyalty. Eventually, he devised a solution that would spare both brothers. He hosted a grand feast, especially for the Trin brothers. During the feast, Liang Wudi jokingly told Trin Thuk, Someone sent you to kill me. Tonight, with just the three of us here, you have a perfect opportunity to do it. Hearing this, Trin Thuk dared not make a move. After the feast, Liang Wudi personally showed Trin Thuk his military forces. Seeing the fortified city of Xiangyang, the strong soldiers, countless warships, echoing war horses, and abundant supplies, Trin Thuk abandoned his initial plan. Not only did he refrain from killing Liang Wudi, but he was also so impressed by the emperor's straightforward and upright demeanor that he voluntarily became his subject. 9. The Wise King and the Importance of Capable Advisors In our country, a king must be more capable and intelligent than others, showing great leadership in handling state affairs. However, when a king relies on his ministers, he does so because he trusts their support and advice, much like someone from the sidelines helping in a game of chess. In the state of Wei, Duke Wu discussed matters with his ministers, and no matter the topic, he always had the upper hand in wisdom. After a meeting, Duke Wu appeared very pleased. An advisor named Ngo Koi approached and asked, Has anyone told the king the story of King So of the state of Chu yet? Curious, Duke Wu asked about the story. Ngo Koi explained that King So was worried whenever he found himself smarter than his ministers. He quoted an old saying, A ruler with wise advisors can establish a kingdom. One with good comrades can maintain sovereignty. One who decisively handles doubts can preserve his state. But one who outsmarts all his ministers risks losing his kingdom. King so feared for his state as he felt no smarter than his ministers and was concerned about the potential downfall of his kingdom. Similarly, while King So was worried, Duke Wu was initially happy. The tale concludes with a lesson. A wise leader must be more capable than others, but he should depend on capable ministers. If a ruler finds himself smarter than all his ministers, he only has flatterers around him, which is a worrying sign. No Koi's words are a reminder that while one should strive to excel on their own, Having competent allies is crucial for managing significant affairs. Kings need skilled advisors because their guidance is essential for governance. This resembles a proverb from the National Strategies that states, An emperor shares his realm with his mentors, a king with his friends, a ruler with his servants, and a failing king with incompetent subordinates. 10. Be generous for a lasting legacy. When interacting with others, it's important to be generous and kind so that they have no reason to feel resentment or dissatisfaction. The good deeds we leave behind after death should be remembered and praised for generations. There's a story from the spring and autumn period about the King of Chu who lost his palace while hunting at the Yunming Marsh. 
his officers quickly went to search for it. The king said, Stop searching. If I lost the palace in Chu, then someone from Chu will find it. It's not really lost. Everyone admired the king's charitable heart. However, when Confucius heard this story, he commented, It's not just about the people of Chu finding the lost palace and considering it not lost. If anyone in the world finds it, it should also be considered not lost. Although Confucius owned no land, his capacity for forgiveness was even greater than that of the King of Chu. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So, Let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom. 11. The Fisherman Saying King Van Kong of the Tan Kingdom was eagerly hunting an animal when he ventured too deep and got lost in a large swamp, not knowing the way out. He met a fisherman and told him, I am the king, I am lost. Show me the way out and I will reward you handsomely. The fisherman replied, I have a saying I would like to offer the king. The king said, Get us out of the swamp first, then you can speak. After leading the king out of the swamp, the king urged, Now what was it you wanted to tell me back there? The fisherman said, Like flamingos and bitterns by the river or sea, if they venture into the marsh they are surely caught in traps. Like turtles and soft-shell turtles deep in the valleys, if they leave their deep haunts for warm shores, they are inevitably caught in nets. Your Majesty went hunting. Why did you wander so far? King Van Kong replied, You are quite right. He then turned to his attendants to note the fisherman's name for a future reward. The fisherman objected, Why should you note my name, Your Majesty? Please, just respect heaven and earth. Take care of your borders. Cherish all your people and lighten their taxes. By doing so, I already benefit from your rule. If you do not respect these things, if you neglect your duties, mishandle foreign affairs, or lose the trust of your people, leading to national disaster and public suffering, no reward to me would be secure or enjoyable. The fisherman concluded, Please, Your Majesty, return to your duties. I must return to my fishing. Conclusion The fisherman, a wise man, advised King Van Kong on two matters, not to indulge excessively in pleasure such as hunting which could harm him, and to govern well so that his people and country prosper. The fisherman's refusal to accept a reward spoke to his foresight and proper concern. Indeed, when a bird's nest is destroyed, no eggs remain unbroken. When a country is invaded or falls into chaos, no individual can hope to enjoy peace. A peaceful reign is more valuable than any reward, and a content mind brings greater joy than any title. 12. Generosity on a Narrow Path A Lesson in Sharing and Harmony When walking on a narrow path, leave a bit of space for others. When enjoying a good meal, Share three parts of it with others. This is the happiest way to behave properly. Truong An was a high-ranking official during the Qing dynasty. When his family was building a home in their village, a land dispute arose with the neighboring Fuang family, leading to a lawsuit. Upon hearing this, Truong An immediately wrote a letter home. The letter said, why fuss over a wall by sending letters across great distances? What harm is there in giving them three feet? The great wall still stands, yet we don't see Emperor Qin Shi Huang fussing about it. After receiving the letter, his family quickly set aside three feet of land. Ashamed, the Puang family did the same. As a result, a wide path six feet across was created between the two homes. 13. The Persimmon Leaf This story tells us that being clever is only amusing for a while and is not as valuable as being practical, which benefits everyone in the long run. 
In the state of song, there was a person who took a piece of jade and carved it into a persimmon leaf over three years. The leaf was crafted with incredible skill, with lifelike veins, stem, sharp edges, fine hairs, and vibrant color, making it indistinguishable from real leaves. This person presented the leaf to the king of song, who admired the craftsmanship and rewarded him. Upon hearing this, Tzu Li Ye remarked, if it took three years for one leaf to grow, there wouldn't be many trees with leaves left in the world. Commentary The story suggests that while being clever can be entertaining temporarily, it isn't as valuable as practical actions that provide long-lasting benefits to everyone. However, the ability to create something as nature does shows great skill. Traditional art has often aimed to mimic nature perfectly. Tzu Li Ye, a follower of Taoist philosophy, believed that natural beauty was supreme, suggesting that even a single natural scene could bring immense joy and pleasure to people. 14. Humility brings benefits, pride causes harm. A container overflows because it is too full, just like a piggy bank remains intact because it is empty. Therefore, a wise and noble person would rather avoid striving for things than have to compete aggressively and would prefer to admit shortcomings rather than be arrogant. After the fall of the Qin dynasty, two rivals, Xiang Yu of Western Chu and Liu Bang of Han, competed for control of the realm. Xiang Yu was stubborn and refused to listen to his subordinate's advice due to his lack of humility. In contrast, Liu Bang was humble, actively seeking out wise and talented individuals. As a result, many left Xiang Yu to support Liu Bang. Liu Bang then led his troops to defeat Xiang Yu, who was surrounded at Gaixia. During a night, Xiang Yu escaped southwards. Liu Bang quickly ordered his cavalry, led by Quan Ying, to pursue him. Xiang Yu crossed the Huai River, but during his escape, many of his soldiers either died or deserted, leaving him with just over a hundred men. At the banks of the Yangtze River, the village chief waited for Xiang Yu with a boat, urging him to cross the river and establish a smaller kingdom as the region was still vast and populous enough to support one. Shang Yu laughed and said, If heaven wants to destroy me, why should I flee across the river? After saying this, he took his own life with his sword. 15. Think before you act. We often want what others desire too. If we blindly follow our wants and grab everything without care, things can go wrong pretty quickly. This story from ancient times illustrates this well. General Von Kong of the Jin Kingdom led his troops to attack the Wei Kingdom. On their way, they encountered an old man plowing his field, constantly looking up to the sky and laughing heartily. Curious, Van Kong asked him, What are you laughing at? The old man explained, I'm laughing at my neighbor. He took his wife to visit some relatives. On their way, they met a young woman picking berries and he was so smitten that he secretly went to talk to her in the berry field. While he was distracted, another man started calling to his wife and she walked away with him. That's the whole story, but I can't help laughing about it. Realizing the folly of his unguarded pursuit, Van Kong decided to lead his troops back home. However, before they even returned, they received news that their northern borders had been invaded. Moral of the story, just as we covet others' things, they might covet ours. If we act recklessly driven by desire, not only do we risk losing the chance to gain anything, but we also might lose what we already have. This applies to nations too. Focusing solely on attacking others without defending our own is like giving our country away to invaders. 16. Being careful in what you say and do is considered virtuous behavior. Even if you speak correctly nine times, it doesn't guarantee praise, but one mistake can lead to criticism. 
Similarly, 9 out of 10 successful strategies might not get recognized, but one failure can result in harsh criticism. It's better for a person of integrity to remain silent rather than speak hastily, and to appear clumsy rather than trying to show off their intelligence. During the Sui dynasty, the father of the famous general Shia Ruoba, Shia Don, held a high position. At the time, there was a proud and arrogant official named Wu Van Ho who disliked being criticized. Xia Don often criticized him openly, which led Wu Van Ho to falsely accuse Xia Don, resulting in his execution. Before his death, Xia Don warned his son about the dangers of reckless speech by hitting his own mouth until it bled, teaching him to be cautious with his words. Initially, Jia Ruoba remembered this lesson and it saved his life multiple times. However, as he grew older and more successful, he became frustrated about not receiving rewards equal to others. Eventually, his habit of speaking carelessly about the emperor's extravagant ways led to his own demise at the age of 64. 17. The Story of the Philanthropist and the Kingdom of Qin the philanthropist from the state of Qi wanted to travel to the kingdom of Qin to give a lecture. Despite thousands of people advising him against it, he was determined to go. Finally, when Tokin came to dissuade him, the philanthropist said, I've taken care of everything concerning humans. Only the matters of spirits and gods remain unclear to me. Tokin replied, That's exactly why I am here, not to discuss human affairs, but to explain the matters of spirits and gods to you. Convinced, the philanthropist asked him to speak. Tukin shared a story. Recently, while crossing a river, I saw a clay statue speaking to a wooden statue. The wooden statue told the clay, You are made of clay. When the flood waters rise, you will dissolve. The clay statue responded, Even if I dissolve, I am still clay and will just return to being clay. But you, carved from wood when the floods come, who knows where you will drift off to and what will become of you? Now, the kingdom of Kin is a dangerous place with a cruel king. If you go there, it's uncertain if you'll be able to come out safely. Upon hearing this, the philanthropist decided not to travel to Kin. Conclusion the philanthropist, despite his confidence and previous reluctance to listen to others, chose to heed to Kin's advice. This story serves as a lesson about the risks of overconfidence and the importance of understanding one's limits. Risk-taking is a valuable trait, but it must be balanced with self-awareness and knowledge of others to avoid failure. 18. Being Fair and Balanced treating others with leniency and strictness. In times of peace and prosperity, it's essential to act with integrity and straightforwardness in your dealings with others. However, in times of chaos and insecurity, you must be flexible and adapt to the situation. In extremely turbulent times nearing collapse, it's necessary to use a combination of both approaches. Treat the virtuous with more leniency and the cruel and wicked with more strictness. With ordinary people, your approach should depend on the specific circumstances, mixing leniency and strictness, kindness and authority as needed. The period of the five dynasties and ten kingdoms in Chinese history was marked by constant changes in dynasties and many short-lived emperors the officials wielding power changed frequently too. Yet amidst this endless turmoil, there was one man who remained calm and untroubled, never overthrown, Feng Dao. Feng Dao served under ten emperors across four dynasties, adept at knowing when to advance or retreat, enjoying high positions and great favor. Feng Dao was not particularly talented or distinguished, he contributed little to politics and lacked the noble spirit of one who loves his homeland and people. When his country was in peril, he sought refuge in another land. 
He never considered the national cause as his responsibility, but always pursued high rank and rich rewards, easily abandoning his duties like a servant changing masters. It is said that before he became well known, he wrote poetry expressing his belief that a fortunate person is born under a lucky star, and despite the changing world, if one remains untroubled at heart, they can always live in peace, a philosophy Feng Dao followed throughout his life, earning him the nickname the Unshakable One in politics. 19. Forgetting the Essential Offering the Kong family was preparing for a ritual sacrifice, but they forgot to include the essential offering. When Confucius heard about this, he predicted that the Kong family would lose their official position within two years. Indeed, the following year, the family did lose their position. His students asked him how he knew this would happen so soon. Confucius explained that the ritual sacrifice is a way to show deep respect and remembrance for one's parents. Forgetting the essential offering during such an important occasion suggested that they might be neglecting other important duties as well. If they could forget something so crucial, it was likely they were making other significant oversights. Therefore, it was logical they would lose their position. Discussion Ritual sacrifices require utmost care, as they are meant to honor the spirits. Only those who are truly devoted and sincere can perform them properly. Forgetting the essential offering, a key part of the ritual, indicates a major oversight. Such lack of sincerity and meticulousness in important duties can lead to broader failures. Confucius used this single incident to predict further issues, showing his deep understanding and foresight, not unlike a prophet, though based on careful observation and logical deduction. 20. Be strict with yourself but forgiving with others. We should forgive the mistakes of others, but not so easily overlook our own. When we face oppression and humiliation, we must patiently endure it. However, when others are oppressed or humiliated, we should try to alleviate their suffering. During the Ming Dynasty, when Triu Du took office as the magistrate of Tung Jiang, he would often tell people who came to file complaints, cool down and come back tomorrow. At first, people did not understand his intentions and nicknamed him come back tomorrow. There was even a rhyme about him. The magistrate of Tung Jiang, come back tomorrow. Later, his family heard about this rhyme and questioned him. Trio Du explained, many complaints are due to temporary anger and frustration and cannot be properly resolved in the heat of the moment. If people calm down or are persuaded by others and their anger subsides, they might not feel the need to pursue their complaints anymore. That is the benefit of coming back tomorrow. 21. Forgiveness and Loyalty, The Tale of King Trang and the Torn Hat Band King Trang of the So Kingdom was hosting a feast where his officials were drinking. As night fell and everyone was getting tipsy, a gust of wind suddenly blew out the candles. During the confusion, one of the officials took the opportunity to pull on a palace maid's clothing. The maid grabbed and ripped off his hat band and reported to the king. Someone pulled on my clothes. I managed to grab his hat band. Please light the candles so we can see whose hat band is torn. He is the one who harassed me. The king dismissed the matter, saying, Let it go. We let people drink and forget their manners, and we shouldn't humiliate someone over a woman's issue. He then declared, Anyone who drinks with me today and doesn't get drunk enough to tear off their hat band isn't having enough fun. Following the king's order, all the officials tore off their hat bands, and the rest of the evening was thoroughly enjoyed. Two years later, the So Kingdom was at war with the Tan Kingdom. In five consecutive battles, an officer bravely led the charge, causing the Tan army to retreat. This led to the victory of the So Kingdom. 
Curious, King Trang summoned the officer and asked, I treated you the same as everyone else. Why do you go to such lengths to help me? The officer replied, I have long wanted to dedicate my life to serve you, Your Majesty. Only now have I had the chance to repay my debt to you. I am Tuong Hung, the one whose hat band was torn that night you forgave. Commentary The king's forgiveness towards the official who harassed the maid shows his magnanimity and understanding of human error. The harasser, in turn, did not forget the mercy shown to him and sought to repay it, demonstrating his loyalty and gratitude. With such a king and such subjects, the kingdom was surely enduring. 22. Stepping back is moving forward. Yielding brings gain. It's wise to be patient and considerate when dealing with others as taking a step back can often be a step toward greater progress. Being tolerant and generous is also a blessing, as it not only makes others feel comfortable but also lays the foundation for your own comfort. A famous scholar from the Eastern Han Dynasty, Kong Rong, was very intelligent and eager to learn from a young age. He was sharp, wise, and quick to respond, earning him the nickname Child Prodigy. At just four years old, he could recite many poems and understood proper etiquette, making his parents very proud of him. One day, his father brought home some pears and saved the biggest one for Kong Rong. However, Kong Rong shook his head and chose the smallest pear instead, saying, I am the youngest, so I should have the smallest pear and the biggest one should go to my elder brother. His father was amazed and delighted by his son's gesture. This story of Kong Rong giving up the larger pear spread far and wide and continues to be passed down, serving as a valuable lesson for parents to teach their children. 23. Refusing Gifts for Integrity being a government official like Kong Angi Hu requires high moral standards. Even something as trivial as a fish, he would carefully consider and refuse to accept. He understood that being favored by others is temporary, but valuing oneself is a long-term strategy. Kong Angi Hu, a general in the state of Lu, was fond of fish. One day when someone offered him a fish, he declined it. His brother was surprised and asked, You like fish and someone is offering it to you. Why won't you accept it? Kong and Gi Hu replied, They must want something from me in return for this fish. If I accept it, I might have to do them a favor. Doing a favor could lead to breaking the law and losing my position. If I lose my position, not only will I not get any more fish as gifts, but I won't be able to buy any either. Therefore, I refuse the fish because I want to ensure that I can enjoy fish for a long time. The ancient philosopher Lao Tzu once said, By putting oneself last, one ends up in front. By setting oneself aside, one remains. Discussion Being a government official like Kong Ngi Hu truly reflects integrity. Even for something as minor as a fish, the type of which is not specified, he thought it over and decided not to accept it. He knew that pleasing others is only temporary, and the real long-term strategy is to value oneself. Before the world worries, he worries for the world, and he rejoices only after the world has rejoiced, thereby setting himself aside so that he remains behind without any personal motives. When one puts oneself last and still remains, what personal desire is there left to satisfy? If an official only focuses on harming others to benefit oneself, they may think they are content, but in reality, they gain no true happiness. 24. A cautionary tale from the underworld, the power of words. When you meet someone who seems deep and reserved, it's best not to rush into making them your confidant. When dealing with arrogant or easily angered people, be careful with what you say. There's a story about a man named Ngai from the Song Dynasty. He once had a high fever and in his delirium he dreamed that he was taken to the underworld. 
There, he was brought before the king of hell to be judged. Some demons said he had committed many misdeeds in life, so the king ordered him to be burned with a huge pile of wood. During this, Nye noticed one demon wearing torn leopard skin pants and asked why he was dressed like that. The demon explained they don't have such material in hell. It's only available if someone burns it from the living world. Nye promised to burn leopard skins for him if the demon reduced the amount of wood for his fire. Delighted, the demon agreed. When Ingai woke up, he warned his disciples, Always remember, the mouth is the door to disaster. 25. Mr. Duong Chan, a model official. Mr. Duong Chan was a government official who served without expecting favors from those he appointed and governed his people without corruption. His integrity was as clear at night as it was during the day. He truly set an example for corrupt officials everywhere. Duong Chan was assigned as the governor of Donglai District. While traveling to his new position through Shuang Ap, the local official, Mr. Vuong Mat, who had previously been promoted by Chan, came to pay his respects. Later that night, Vuong Mat tried to offer Chan gold as a gift. Chan responded, I appointed you because I knew you were capable, yet you still don't understand me if you think I would accept such a gift. Despite Vuong Mat's insistence, claiming that no one would know, Chan retorted, Heaven knows, earth knows you know, and I know. How can you say no one knows? Embarrassed, Vuong Mat left. Chan remained a devoted official, focusing solely on the welfare of his people and the country, never engaging in corruption or enriching himself. He often said, being an official and leaving a legacy of integrity for my descendants is far more valuable than leaving them wealth. Commentary Just like Mr. Duong Chan, who didn't expect gratitude from those he helped and served his people without corruption, officials should avoid greed. Gathering wealth for oneself doesn't guarantee it can be kept safely, let alone be a worthy legacy for one's children. Leaving behind a legacy of integrity is far superior to leaving wealth gained dishonestly, which could only lead to arrogance and eventual ruin of one's descendants. 26. Unchanging Virtue, Hidden Talent People who don't care about fame are often doubted by those who crave it. Those who live simply and cautiously are usually envied by those who are reckless. A person of integrity should stick to their moral lifestyle and not change their character because of this, but they should also avoid showing off their talents too much. During the Three Kingdoms period, Chao Chao had an advisor named Yang Xu. Once, Yang Xu followed Chao Chao into battle, and when they failed to capture a city, Chao Chao decided to camp and hold their position. At that moment, Yang Xu heard Chao Cao mutter, Chicken tendons, chicken tendons. Realizing that Chao Cao wanted to retreat, he told the soldiers, The general plans to withdraw. Consequently, everyone in the camp started packing up to retreat. When Chao Cao saw this, he was surprised and asked the soldiers why they were doing this. After finding out that Yang Xu had understood his intentions, Chao Cao admired Yang Xu's intelligence, but also envied his cleverness. He then used the excuse that Yang Xu was causing unrest among the troops and ordered his execution. Yang Xu died because he relied on his talent and underestimated others, showing off his abilities in front of Chao Cao without realizing the danger he was in, ultimately leading to his own demise. After Yang Xu's death, his father, Yang Bu was deeply saddened. When Chao Cao asked him, Why do you look so frail? Yang Bu sighed and said, I feel ashamed because I never expected my son to face such a tragic end. Chao Cao felt very guilty upon hearing this. 27. Master Tang Sam When children see their parents acting inappropriately, they must find a way to either avoid conflict or gently intervene without being disrespectful. 
Master Tang Sam once accidentally damaged some roots while weeding a cucumber field. His father, Tang Titch, became angry and hit him on the back with a stick. The pain was so severe that Tang Sam collapsed, and it took a while for him to recover. When he returned home, he respectfully informed his father that he was at fault for causing him to exert himself to the point of pain. After explaining, he stepped back and began to play music and sing, intending to show his father that he was no longer in pain. Confucius heard about this incident and told his disciples to deny Tang Sam entry. Tang Sam, believing himself innocent, asked a friend why Confucius was upset. Confucius explained, In ancient times, Shun served his father, Gu Su, always staying by his side during commands but distancing himself when his father's anger could lead to harm. When beaten with a whip, Shun endured, but when threatened with a stick, he fled. Thus, Gu Su was never blamed for unfilial behavior. Now, Sam, you risked your life to appease your father's anger to the extent of fainting. What if he had struck you fatally? Wouldn't that implicate your father in a serious crime? There's no greater breach of filial duty than this. Upon hearing this, Tang Sam realized his mistake and apologized to Confucius. Conclusion it's understood that a truly filial child might sacrifice their life for their parents, but recklessly endangering oneself during their wrath is not only unwise, but also potentially implicates the parents in severe misconduct. While Master Sam was indeed devoted, his approach was not appropriate. Master Shun, on the other hand, was also devoted but knew how to handle right and wrong. When children see their parents acting wrongly, they have a duty to either evade or softly dissuade them without being considered disrespectful. 28. Stand tall. Despite envy. It's better to uphold your moral integrity and not follow or please others if it means compromising your own beliefs. Even if disliked by some, it's preferable to stay true to yourself than to commit wrongful deeds just to avoid criticism. In the time of Emperor Yuan of the Western Han Dynasty, there was a famous official named Jia Si Feng. He was upright, did not flatter or fear the powerful, and bravely exposed those who were devious and influential. This made many high-ranking officials of that era fear him. When he was appointed as a senior officer, another high official named Hua Chuang, favored by the emperor, often acted arrogantly. Once, when a servant of Hua Chuang broke the law in a matter involving Hua Chuang himself, Jia Feng personally went to arrest him. Hua Chuang, terrified, ran to the palace for protection. Although Jia Feng could not arrest him due to the emperor's protection, his commitment to enforcing the law and his fearlessness in the face of power earned him great admiration from later generations. 29. Stealing in Broad Daylight When someone becomes so greedy that they disregard moral principles, no matter how small or large their theft, they are deserving of contempt. However, those with influential positions who, out of a desire for wealth, betray their mentors and friends and covertly harm their own people, are far more reprehensible than petty thieves who steal in broad daylight just to feed themselves. Yet, society often only mocks the petty thieves and fails to punish those who commit greater evils. In the state of Jin, there was a man so greedy that he would take anything he saw in the market. He claimed, I can eat this, I can wear this, I can spend this, I can use this, and then he would just take it. When people demanded payment, he said, my greed blinded me. I thought everything in the market was mine and I couldn't see anyone else. Let me keep these things and when I'm wealthy, I'll pay you back. The market supervisor, seeing his brazenness, whipped him and made him return the items to their owners, which made everyone laugh. The man retorted, There are many more greedy than I, who use all kinds of tricks to steal from others. Although I did this in broad daylight, am I really any worse than them? 
you laugh at me because you haven't thought it through. Conclusion. Those blinded by greed, regardless of the amount, are contemptible. Yet, those with power who deceive and betray for wealth, harming their own people, commit far greater crimes than those who steal openly to survive. Society often mocks the petty thieves without addressing the major wrongdoers. 30. To build a good life, one must aim high, and in dealing with others, one must be willing to yield. If our interactions with others don't reach a noble standard, it's like shaking dust off our clothes or washing our feet in mud. How can we hope to rise above the ordinary? If we don't step back to think things through, we might rush into danger like a moth to a flame or a goat butting its head against a fence. How can that lead to a peaceful life? During the Tang Dynasty, there was a man named Su Ding who was known for his diligence in studies from a young age and excelled in literature. He was often called the chief among scholars. Later, Su Ding became a high official and worked with the renowned general Song Jing. Song Jing was very straightforward and brave, often making decisions without consulting Su Ding. Su Ding's family criticized him, saying, Song Jing is stubborn and doesn't respect you, yet you always give in to him. Are you still acting like a high official should? Su Ding smiled and said, It's not that Song Jing looks down on me, but because his straightforward nature can be misunderstood. I yield to him, not because I'm afraid, but because I care about the bigger picture and put our country's interests first. How can I put my personal feelings above our nation's welfare? Sometimes when Song Jing reported to Emperor Huan Zong and was questioned closely, Su Ding would step in and explain the situation in detail, touching Song Jing, who told him, You devote yourself to public duties without a thought for your own interests. 31. The Power of Rumor a tale of mistaken identity and public opinion. Tang Sam was known for his kindness and respect for his parents. His mother was a trustworthy person who believed wholeheartedly in her son. Suddenly, someone claimed, Tang Sam has killed someone. His mother didn't believe it. Even when a second person told her, she remained skeptical. But when a third person said the same, she panicked and fled. This shows how powerful public opinion can be. Tang Sam lived in a place called Phi. There, another man with the same name committed a murder. Someone rushed to inform Tang Sam's mother, saying, Tang Sam has killed someone. She replied, My son would never kill anyone, and calmly continued her weaving. Then another person came with the same accusation. She said nothing and kept on weaving. When yet another person came with the same news, she got scared, dropped her loom, and climbed over the wall to escape. Conclusion Tang Sam was a gentle and dutiful son, and his mother was very trusting of him. Initially, when people started saying, Tang Sam has killed someone, she didn't believe them. But as more people repeated the accusation, she ended up panicking and running away. This shows how strong the influence of public opinion can be. Even a completely false accusation, if repeated by enough people, can make us doubt the truth. It's like mistaking a snake for a worm or a dog for a sheep. For instance, there are no tigers in a marketplace, but if one, two, or three people start saying there is one, soon everyone believes it. Those who can remain independent of public opinion are rare, but it is a highly admirable quality. Only when a truth is proven with absolute certainty should it be accepted. 32. Hide your skill behind seeming clumsiness. Mask clarity with obscurity. Smart people often do not show off their talents and may pretend to be foolish. Even if capable, they should not rush to prove themselves, but rather remain humble and discreet. High-minded individuals shouldn't deem themselves superior, but should act gently. 
When the chance to demonstrate their abilities arises, they shouldn't hastily seek advancement but step back to move further ahead. This is the wise way to live quietly and keep a steady presence. During the Qing Dynasty, the famous painter Trin Ban Qiu once wrote, Knowing how to play the fool is valuable. He didn't encourage everyone to act naive or simple-minded, but taught them to hide their cleverness and live cleanly amid the murky. He was very intelligent and clear-headed. It is said that a villager once gave him a bowl of dog meat and received a painting in return, whereas high-ranking officials could not obtain even a single character from him, despite offering thousands of pounds. One day, Trin Ban Kyu smelled delicious dog meat while visiting a friend and followed the scent. He struck up a conversation with the man cooking, and after tasting the meat, he joyfully gifted him a painting. Later, he learned that the man was a wealthy landlord who had devised this dog-meat strategy to acquire a painting. After this incident, Trin Ban Kyu decided to become a vegetarian. He maintained his good reputation both in life and after death, showing that he was a thoughtful man. Living simply and harmlessly in small matters brings joy, so why not embrace it? 33. Going out in white, returning in black. When he left, he wore a white shirt, and when he returned, he wore a dark one. He didn't realize how much he had changed, but his dog noticed and started barking and chasing him. It was wrong to hit the dog. It was his own fault for changing, not the dog's for reacting. One sunny day, Duong Bo went out. He wore a white shirt from home, but got caught in a rainstorm halfway through his trip, soaking his clothes. He took shelter at a relative's house, who lent him a dark shirt. When the rain stopped, Duong Bo wore the dark shirt and headed home. His dog saw him and started barking and biting. Duong Bo was about to hit the dog with a stick when his brother, Duong Chu, stopped him, saying, Don't hit him. It's natural for him to react like this. Imagine if our white dog left white but came back black. Wouldn't you be surprised and unsuspecting too? Commentary Going out in white and returning in black, not realizing one's own changes while the dog sees and reacts, hitting the dog would indeed be a mistake. It's on us for changing, not on the dog for reacting. Similarly, in life, when we do something unusual that others don't understand, they will naturally have different opinions. If we don't reflect on whether our changes are good or bad and only blame others for their views, it's just like Duong Bo hitting the dog in the story. 34. Being blameless is an achievement. Being resentment-free is a virtue. In dealing with others, one should not exhaust themselves chasing fame and fortune. It's already a great accomplishment if one can avoid making mistakes. When interacting with others, give generously without expecting anything in return. If others do not hold grudges against you, that is the best reward. Tao Tom, during the Western Han Dynasty, was a great general under Emperor Liu Bang of Han. He followed Liu Bang through many campaigns in the north and south, earning significant honors. After unifying the country, Liu Bang appointed him as the prime minister of the state of Tai Tao Tam was formidable in battle, winning wherever he fought, a figure who shook the heavens and moved the earth on the battlefield. However, in politics, Tao Tam was not adept at governing the people. During a moment of uncertainty, someone advised him, My lord, there is an old man in our state who is skilled in the philosophy of Huang Lao. He is very wise in his dealings with people. Please do not hesitate to seek his advice. Tao Tom was delighted and immediately sent for him. The old man quickly arrived and said to Tao Tom, The essence of governance is valued in tranquility. By maintaining calmness as the foundation and governing without overt actions, one can achieve being blameless is an achievement, being resentment-free is a virtue then the people will naturally live peaceful and stable lives. 
Tao Tom followed the old man's advice immediately. From then on, under Tao Tom's rule, the state of Tay indeed enjoyed social stability, and the people were content with their lives. 35. The wood that cannot be pierced and the spear that pierces everything. There was a man from the state of Chu who sold both wood and spears. When someone wanted to buy wood, he would boast, This wood is so solid, nothing can pierce it. And when another asked about his spears, he would claim, This spear is so sharp, it can pierce anything. One day, someone asked him, So what happens if you use your spear to stab your wood? The man couldn't answer. The moral of the story. Oh, how can something that cannot be pierced and something that can pierce anything coexist without contradicting each other? Yet, the man from Chu dared to boast about both his wood and spears at the same time. It was merely for personal gain that he ended up lying. But such a lie falls apart when faced with logical questioning. It's just like a person who tries to sell a wooden statue in the market claiming, whoever buys this statue will become wealthy. But when asked, then why don't you keep it at home to become wealthy yourself instead of selling it? The seller is left speechless and has no choice but to take the statue back home. 36. Advice to the thoughtless and the overly cautious. It's important not to harbor harmful thoughts, but also essential to be cautious of others. This advice is for those who haven't fully matured in their thinking. It's better to endure being wrong than to falsely assume others have malicious intentions. This is guidance for those who are overly cautious. Mastering these two aspects means one has achieved thoughtful insight and a generous heart. Hua Jing Tong, a founding hero of the Tang Dynasty, once assisted Emperor Taizong, Li Ximin. One day, the emperor asked Hua Jing Tong, I see that among all the court officials, you are wise and just, yet many speak ill of you in my presence. Why is that? Hua Jing Tong replied, Just as some adore the bright moon while others despise it, and farmers love gentle spring rains for greening the land while travelers curse the muddy roads, not even the gods can satisfy everyone's desires, let alone a mere mortal like me. Your majesty should be wary of sycophants and troublemakers. Do not trust their slander, as even a slight mistake can lead to disaster. If a king listens to slander, good officials are executed. If parents listen, their children suffer. If spouses listen, they separate. If siblings listen, discord arises. If friends listen, they drift apart. Your majesty should not intend harm, but it's still wise to be cautious. The emperor responded, Ah, I see now. 37. The debate between Giap and At. Whenever Giap and At debate, it's hard to tell whether the sound comes from the bell or the striker. A bell is naturally supposed to make noise, but without something to hit it, it remains silent. So, if you want it to make a sound, you need both the bell and the striker. Giap asks At. If you cast a bell out of bronze and carve a striker from wood, and you use the striker to hit the bell making a boom boom sound, does the sound come from the wood or the bronze? At replies, if you hit a wall with the striker, it makes no sound, but it does when you hit the bell, so the sound comes from the bronze. Giap asks, if you hit a solid bronze coin with the striker and it makes no sound, does that mean the sound always comes from the bronze? At responds, the coin is solid, the bell is hollow, so the sound comes from hollow objects. Giap asks, if you make a bell out of wood or cork and it makes no sound when struck, does that mean the sound always comes from hollow objects? Conclusion. Whenever Giap and At debate, it's also unclear whether the sound is from the bell or the striker. A bell is meant to make noise, but without a striker it doesn't. So, for a sound to occur, both are necessary. What is sound? It's just the noise that arises when two objects collide. However, 
If we say the sound comes solely from both the bell and the striker, it's like claiming that two opposites, black and white, are the same. The truth isn't simple, and the more they argue, the more confusing it can get. It's better to understand the situation rather than stubbornly stick to one's point. To truly understand physics, you need science. Without scientific knowledge, discussing physics is just guesswork. 38. Forget grudges and remember kindness. When you do someone a favor, don't keep it in your heart for too long. When you make a mistake, always reflect on yourself. Remember those who show you kindness deeply, but forgive quickly those who wrong you. During the spring and autumn period in China, a favorite minister of Duke Ling of Jin, named Zhao Kui, killed Zhao Shi, leaving only an orphan, Zhao Wu. At that time, a man named Gong Tong Chuzhu and his friend Cheng Ying planned to save Zhao Wu to repay the kindness Zhao's family had shown them and to preserve the last of the Zhao bloodline. Cheng Ying offered his own son, who was of similar age to Zhao Wu, to be mistaken for him and handed him over to Gong Tong Chuzhou. Then he accused Gong Tong Chuzhou of hiding Zhao Wu. Zhao Kui believed this and went to kill both Gong Tong Chuzhou and the imposter Zhao Wu, while Cheng Ying hid the real Zhao Wu in the mountains. Fifteen years later, Duke Jing of Jin reversed the verdict against the Zhao family and welcomed Zhao Wu back, punishing Zhao Kui's family. When Zhao Wu learned the truth, he wanted to repay Cheng Ying's kindness. Cheng Ying refused, saying, I did it to repay your father's kindness to me, not for your gratitude. Afterward, Cheng Ying took his own life. During the spring and autumn period in China, a favorite minister of Duke Ling of Jin named Zhao Kui killed Zhao Shi, leaving only an orphan, Zhao Wu. At that time, a man named Gong Tong Chuzhou and his friend Cheng Ying planned to save Zhao Wu to repay the kindness Zhao's family had shown them and to preserve the last of the Zhao bloodline. Cheng Ying offered his own son, who was of similar age to Zhao Wu, to be mistaken for him and handed him over to Gong Tong Chuzhou. Then, he accused Gong Tong Chuzhou of hiding Zhao Wu. Zhao Kui believed this and went to kill both Gong Tong Chuzhou and the imposter Zhao Wu, while Cheng Ying hid the real Zhao Wu in the mountains. Fifteen years later, Duke Jing of Jin reversed the verdict against the Zhao family and welcomed Zhao Wu back, punishing Zhao Kui's family. When Zhao Wu learned the truth, he wanted to repay Cheng Ying's kindness. Cheng Ying refused, saying, I did it to repay your father's kindness to me, not for your gratitude. Afterward, Cheng Ying took his own life. 39. The Strategy of Hunting Tigers Mencius once said, Having wisdom is good, but it's not as useful as taking advantage of the situation. Being ready is fine, but waiting for the right moment is better. This means that being smart and alert is good, but it's even better to seize the right opportunity, and it's easier to succeed when you act at the right time. There were two tigers eating a buffalo. Bian Zhang wanted to go and spear the tigers. A young boy advised him, Wait a moment, sir. Tigers are fierce and buffaloes are their favorite prey. Right now, as the two tigers share the buffalo, enjoying the tasty meat, they will surely fight over it. When they fight, the weaker tiger will die, and the stronger one will get injured. If you attack them then, wouldn't you be able to handle one and capture both easily? Wouldn't that mean using less effort for more gain? Bian Zhang agreed with the boy's advice and did as suggested, successfully capturing both tigers. The morale of the story teaches us that knowing when to take advantage of an opportunity can make a task easier and more likely to succeed. Like Bian Zhang, catching two tigers directly would require a lot of effort and might not even be successful. But by waiting for them to fight, where one dies and the other is wounded, 
he only needed to deal with the injured tiger to capture both. This story also aligns with Mencius's philosophy. Having wisdom is good, but it's not as useful as taking advantage of the situation. Being ready is fine, but waiting for the right moment is better, emphasizing that smart and timely actions lead to success. 40. Virtue and Integrity – The Timeless Lessons of Yang Zhen Focus on nurturing your virtues and perform acts of kindness without expecting anything in return. Even the smallest actions matter when it comes to personal growth. It is important to help even those who cannot repay your kindness. During the Eastern Han Dynasty, Yang Zhen was a man of integrity. He served as the Prime Minister under Emperor Han Chao Di and was honored with the title Peaceful Marquis. Yang Zhen was well known among scholars of the time and taught thousands of students, earning him the nickname Scholar from the West. He was also appointed as the Governor of Dong Lai. While on his way to assume this new role, he passed through Xiang Ap, where the local magistrate Wang Mi, a man Yang Zhen had previously recommended for his position, tried to thank him by offering ten pounds of gold and silver late at night. However, Yang Zhen firmly refused to accept it, saying, A true gentleman performs acts of kindness without expecting repayment. I recommended you because of your abilities, not because I wanted something in return. Wang Mi responded, But no one knows about this night. Yang Zhen, moved, replied, Heaven knows, the spirits know, you know, I know, how can you say no one knows? Embarrassed, Wang Mi excused himself and left. 41. A Mother Pig's Bias A true gentleman never judges based on different appearances to love or hate. He especially avoids making decisions based on conflicting interests which might lead to alliances or conflicts, closeness or estrangement, promises or betrayals. There was a family named Tsu Sa, with a completely black sow that gave birth to three piglets, two black like herself and one spotted. The sow nurtured the two black piglets with great care and worry. However, she despised the spotted one and eventually attacked and killed it. Tsu Hua Tsu remarked, It's shocking how quickly hearts can change. If we can't see past appearances, we instantly divide the world into those we love and those we hate. Even a mother can harm her own child out of hate, let alone how she might treat a stranger. People in peaceful times are close and make promises as if they are unbreakable. But when it comes to personal gain, even the smallest differences can lead to great conflicts and immediate harm. How dreadful! Such a changing heart is no different from that of the Sao. Conclusion Usually, people of the same kind or belief tend to like and care for each other. However, they often mistrust and despise outsiders, seeing them as enemies, which is truly regrettable. A true gentleman never allows differences in appearance or conflicting interests to influence his emotions or actions. Even if others do not share our lineage, thoughts, or goals, but are honorable and upright, we should still offer love and respect. This is what it means to love humanity and value human dignity. Otherwise, we are no better than the biased mother pig. 42. We must be very careful with every thought and action. If you have thoughts that disrespect sacred taboos, words that harm human harmony, or actions that bring misfortune to future generations, we should remember and remind later generations. During the Kuangtu era of the Qing dynasty, there was a very poor family named Kuang. One day, with no food left at home, Kuang Mo carried the only valuable thing they owned, a water jar to sell on the street, but no one showed interest. Fortunately, someone wanted to buy it, but just as they were paying, the owner of Lam Chi Street walked by, noticed a crack at the bottom of the jar, and pointed it out to the buyer, who then declined to buy it. 
Kuang Mo had to carry the jar back home, but on the way, he dropped and shattered it. Thinking of his family waiting at home for the money to buy rice, he felt even more miserable and sat down by the road and cried. Passersby felt sorry for him and gave him some valuable items, but these turned out to be stolen goods, and the authorities arrested him as a suspected thief. Kuang Mo believed that all his misfortunes stemmed from the Lam Chi Street owner's comment, and out of resentment, he accused the owner of being the mastermind behind the theft. The authorities sentenced both men to death. The owner of Lam Chi Street's careless remark had harmed others and himself, ultimately leading to their execution. 43. The Tale of the Donkey This story illustrates that in life, many people and things may initially seem strange and intriguing, sparking our interest or fear. However, once we become familiar with them, we often dismiss them as unimportant. There once was a land called Kiem, where donkeys were unknown. Someone curious brought a few donkeys there and let them roam at the foot of the mountains. At first, the tigers from the mountains saw these large, strong donkeys and thought they were divine creatures. The loud braying of the donkeys scared the tigers, making them run away with their tails tucked. Over time, as the tigers got used to the sound and sight of the donkeys, they began to scorn them. One day, a tiger decided to attack a donkey. The donkey, enraged, kicked back repeatedly with the same move. The tiger, realizing the donkey's limited skills, became overjoyed and thought, so this is all the talent the donkey has. Then the tiger pounced, mauled, and eventually devoured the donkey. Moral. The story conveys that, in life, the novelty of things and people wears off over time, leading us to underestimate them. What looked like a golden statue at first turns out to be a mere clay figure on a rainy day. It also critiques those who are foolish enough to expose their vulnerabilities, making it easy for others to harm them, much like the donkey in the story. The term Kiem's donkeys is often used to describe people who are underachievers or lack notable skills. Dispose 44. Be tolerant and avoid showing anger. When you discover someone's dishonest actions, it's best not to express too much dissatisfaction or speak about it immediately. Similarly, if you feel oppressed, try not to show your anger. This approach has a deep significance, the wonders of which might never be fully understood. During the reign of Emperor Xuan of Han, Prime Minister Bing Ji had a driver who often drank too much. Once, while Bing Ji was out, the driver got drunk and vomited in the carriage. The household manager scolded him and wanted to fire him, but Bing Ji intervened, saying, If we fire him just for this drunken mistake, who else would want to hire him? Let's be patient. It's just a stain on the carriage mat after all. The driver was very grateful and changed his ways thereafter. Living on the frontier, one day he saw an important message at a military post, indicating that enemies had invaded Yunjong Daizhou. He quickly reported back to Bing Ji. Thanks to this timely information, Bing Ji was able to repel the enemy attack. 45. Being afraid of doing evil shows there's still some good left in a person. This proves that doing good isn't always a big deal. Someone who does wrong but fears others finding out still cares about their reputation. Deep down, even in their cruelty, they have a bit of conscience leaning towards good. Those who do a little good and quickly want others to know are just seeking shallow praise to boost their reputation. When people do good with such motives, they are actually planting seeds of evil. During the reign of Emperor Wen of Sui, General Zhao Khan became the governor of Jizhou. When he discovered that local traders were cheating the people, he had bronze weights and iron rulers made and placed in the market for public use. This helped prevent the traders' dishonest practices. Afterwards, he reported this to Emperor Wen, who greatly praised the initiative and ordered it to be implemented nationwide. 
Once, someone stole a medicinal plant from Zhao Kahn's garden. When the thief was caught by Zhao Kahn's men and brought to him, Zhao said, It's my fault for not educating and influencing him enough. What crime has he really committed? He then spoke kindly and reassuringly to the thief and had him sent home. What surprised everyone most was that Zhao ordered a cart full of the plant to be given to the thief. The thief was so ashamed that he vowed never to steal again. Zhao gave him the plants because he understood that the thief, doing evil but afraid of being known, still has a leaning towards good, and there was still hope for him to change. Therefore, influencing others isn't just about punishment, but about transforming them through our own virtues. 46. Wealth can lead to indifference, and closeness breeds envy. Among the wealthy, emotions swing more clearly between warmth and coldness compared to those less fortunate. Jealousy and resentment are more severe among close relatives than with outsiders. In such cases, if one cannot manage through silence and self-control with a pleasant demeanor, many end up feeling daily frustration. During the Warring States period, the famous orator Su Qin initially lived in poverty, having failed in his early attempts at oratory and returning home discouraged. His siblings and in-laws mocked him, deeply hurting his pride. He shut himself indoors and dedicated a year to studying, after which he ventured out again and achieved remarkable success, eventually holding significant positions in six states. When Su Kin returned to his village in fine clothes with a large entourage, those who had once mocked him knelt in respect. He asked them why they had been arrogant before, but were respectful now, to which they replied that it was because of his high status and wealth. It turned out they respected him in hopes of gaining favors. Realizing this, Su Kin lamented, When rich, relatives fear you. When poor, they scorn you. Such is the warmth and coldness of human nature. 47. Pride can lead to isolation while harmony brings great blessings. Just like the weather in nature, a mild climate encourages everything to flourish while a cold climate causes things to wither and become quiet. Therefore, those who are arrogant and indifferent will face coldness. Only those who are enthusiastic and joyfully help others will be warmly rewarded and enjoy lasting happiness. In 279 BC, the king of Qin invited the king of Zhao to a meeting at Mianchi, preparing an ambush to capture him. Lan Xiangru, a wise and brave official from Zhao, cleverly responded to protect the king of Zhao from humiliation. After returning to the court, the king of Zhao appointed him as a high-ranking general, a position higher than the general Lian Po of Zhao. Lian Po was upset and complained to his subordinates, I am a great general of Zhao and have achieved much. What has Lan Xianggru done to deserve being placed above me? When Lan Xianggru heard this, one day he saw Leon Po's carriage approaching and directed his own carriage down a side road to let Leon Po pass. Lan Xiangru's men criticized him for being too timid. Lan Xiangru replied, If I am not afraid of the King of Qin, why would I fear General Leon Po? I am worried about discord between us being exploited by the enemy state of Qin, which would harm Zhao. This incident was reported to Lian Po, who felt ashamed and rushed to Lan Xiangru's residence with a whip to punish himself. Lan Xiangru quickly said, I appreciate your understanding. There is no need for you to blame yourself. Both were moved to tears. From then on, they worked together, both in civil and military capacities, wholeheartedly for the state of Zhao. This famous story from Chinese history illustrates the importance of harmony between leaders. 48. Don't fear the petty man, but beware the false gentleman. A so-called upright man who pretends to be good is no different from a scoundrel freely committing evil. 
A nobleman who changes his moral compass is inferior to a scoundrel who feels remorse and strives to become a better person. In the novel The Tale of General Yang by an anonymous Ming Dynasty author, Yang Huai, the son of the famous Northern Song Dynasty general Yang Van Guang, is known for his steadfast and unflinching character, never flattering or pandering to the powerful. While Emperor Song Shenzong was in power, Yang Van Guang was honored as Invincible General after his conquests in the West, which caused envy and hatred in the treacherous general, Zhang Mao. Zhang Mao appeared calm and respectful on the outside, always acting humble, but in reality, he was a selfish and envious scoundrel. He framed Yang Van Guang in front of Emperor Song Shenzong, nearly leading to the execution of the entire Yang family. Afterwards, Yang Huai pretended to be a robber, killed Zhang Mao, and then retreated to live in seclusion. When Emperor Song Shenzong later learned the whole story, he felt deeply guilty towards Yang Van Guang and sent Prince Wang Feng to invite Yang Huai back to assist in government affairs. Yang Huai refused by choosing death over a return to the corrupt court. He preferred to farm in his garden, living off the food he grew himself, preserving his integrity for a lifetime. He found it unbearable to navigate the complexities of social relations, especially in forming friendships with true gentlemen, leading him to ultimately decide to live in seclusion in the mountains, far from worldly strife. 49. Avoid personal greed and do not hesitate to act on principle. Personal desires should not be influenced by short-term greed for wealth and comfort, as giving in to these desires can lead to a steep downfall. Morally, one should not hesitate to act out of fear of difficulty, as hesitating can distance one from the truth and lead to endless challenges and hardships. Sun Dao, a notable figure during the Western Jin Dynasty, came from a poor family before he became an official. He once told his wife Han Ti, Right now, we endure hunger and cold, living a life full of hardships. One day, I may become a high official, and I do not know if you will still be alive to see it. Indeed, Sun Dao eventually attained a high position, his status comparable to that of a king, but he remained frugal and upright, not indulging in luxuries or personal servants. All the gifts and rewards he received were distributed to friends back home. Once, a corrupt official named Vien Ngi, who was accepting bribes for personal gain, sent Sun Dao a hundred pounds of silk. Since it was customary to follow such practices at the time, Sun Dao reluctantly accepted the silk, but stored it away untouched. When Vien Ngi was eventually investigated for corruption, everyone who had accepted bribes from him was called in. Sun Dao presented the dusty silk from storage to the authorities, which allowed him to avoid being implicated in the scandal. 50. Don't brag about your beauty. Nobody makes themselves ugly. When you act gracefully, there are always opposite actions. But if you don't boast about your beauty, who can criticize you for being ugly? When you behave purely, there are always opposing actions. But if you don't praise yourself as pure, who can mock you for being impure? During the Tang Dynasty, Empress Wu Zetian summoned the newly appointed Prime Minister Di Renjie to the palace and asked him, What do you think of General Lu Su Duck? Di Renji replied, he is a military commander, excellent in defense, making our country's borders secure like a giant lock, and has been respected for many years. Normally, he is forgiving and kind, respected by all, but he is not very persuasive, which shows his knowledge is still lacking. Wu Zetian said, Did you know that I trust him as my prime minister entirely based on Lu Su Duke's recommendation? So, this might show that he is indeed very knowledgeable. Embarrassed, Di Renji said, 
I have worked with General Lu for many years, yet I did not understand him as well as he understands me. This shows my knowledge is indeed inferior. General Lu does not flaunt his fame. He is highly virtuous, and I am truly no match for him. 51. Extreme Loyalty, The Tragic Tale of Yi Ya's Sacrifice for Duke Huan of Qi Flattery and dependence are common human behaviors. People often rely on others when they are in need and distance themselves when they are well off. They praise the wealthy and powerful, but turn away when those people fall into hardship. This is a common flaw among people. Duke Juan of Qi was known as one of the five hegemons during the spring and autumn period. After declaring himself hegemon, he became very self-satisfied, which caused his ambition and determination to fade. His court was filled with deceitful advisors. Du Quan loved fine foods, and once, while talking to a chef named Yi Ya, he joked, I have tasted every delicacy in the world except human flesh. I hear it's quite delicious, but I wonder if that's true. Yi Ya disheartened by his slow career advancement, saw an opportunity to prove his loyalty. He went home, saw his three-year-old son with tender skin, and made the dreadful decision to kill him and cook his flesh to present to Du Quan. When Du Quan learned that Yi Ya had killed and cooked his own son to please him, he was impressed, believing that such loyalty to a king surpassed even parental love. Yi Ya sacrificed his son for a chance at a better position, a truly extreme act of subservience. 52. Acts of True Kindness, the story of Han Xin and the reward of generosity. Give without expecting anything in return. If you expect a return, it is no longer a true act of kindness. When you help others, don't keep a mental tally or boast about it. That way, even a small kindness can bring a great reward. But if you give expecting a repayment, even a massive contribution might hold little real value. Han Xin, a famous general from the early Western Han dynasty, often faced hostility as a commoner. He used to eat at the village leader's house, where he wasn't welcome and was often ignored at mealtime. Out of necessity, Han Xin fished for his meals, and during this time, an old lady named Mrs. Few noticed his plight and shared her food with him for many days. Han Xin appreciated this and promised to repay her kindness grandly. However, Mrs. Few told him she hadn't helped him expecting anything in return. Later, when Han Xin achieved great success, he returned and gratefully presented Mrs. Few with a thousand caddies of gold. The village leader, on the other hand, received only a small gift as Han Xin remarked, You are a petty person. You do good, but with a short-term view. 53. Loyalty and Success Through Virtue People who value loyalty and integrity should strive to maintain harmony by being genuinely humble and friendly to avoid causing hidden conflicts and disasters. Similarly, those who achieve fame and success must preserve their virtues of humility and kindness to avoid the flaws of envy and jealousy. During the period of the Sixteen Kingdoms, the founding emperor of the later Zhao dynasty was Shi Le. In his youth, he was close friends with a neighbor named Gi Yang. One time, they fought over a trivial matter, and neither of the competitive young men would back down, both ending up with bloody heads. After this, they became enemies and stopped interacting. Once Shi Li became emperor and hosted a banquet, he invited Guiyang. A few days later, Guiyang arrived at the capital, and during the banquet, Shi Li tapped on Guiyang's sturdy arm and joked, Back then, I punched you quite a bit, and you also hit me pretty hard. We were both quite fierce. Remembering this, Gui Yang was initially afraid that Shi Lei might seek revenge, but at the meeting, he did not argue and simply laughed heartily. After the banquet in front of everyone, 
Shi Lei appointed Gui Yang as a military advisor and even gifted him a beautiful house. From then on, Gui Yang devoted himself fully to supporting Shi Lei, achieving many military successes. 54. Seeing the good, the world is at peace. If deep in our hearts we believe that the world is complete, then it will appear without flaws. If we sincerely feel that the world is generous, fair, and honest, then deceit and treachery will have no place. During the Northern Song Dynasty, there was a poet who lived secluded in the forest on a desolate mountain west of Hangzhou. He kept to himself, avoiding worldly affairs. He grew three sixty-five plum trees, diligently weeding and fertilizing them every day. When the plums blossomed, traders came to buy them. He sold the plums not by weight, but by the number of trees, and at reasonable prices, so the traders were always eager to buy his plums. He also prepared three sixty-five bamboo tubes, and whether or not he had visitors, he only used the money from one tube each day, never spending more than that amount. He raised two white cranes. When visitors arrived, he would signal for them, and the cranes would immediately come to him. He would put money and a note in a bag and tie it around one of their necks. The crane would fly to the market to buy meat, fish, wine, and other items for him. The vendors, seeing the crane, knew he had guests and would deliver the goods as instructed in the note then collect the money tied to the crane's neck to bring back. Despite his simple lifestyle, he felt joyful and content. Legend says that he never married. He chose the plum trees as his wife and viewed the cranes as his children, hence the saying, plum wife, crane children. 55. Gold must pass through the fire many times to be tested, just like arrows should not be shot carelessly. Shaping your willpower is like metalworking. It takes many practice sessions to succeed. Those who rush for quick success will not gain deep knowledge. Everything you do, like using a bow and arrow, requires full strength to pull tightly. If you approach tasks too comfortably and carelessly, you won't achieve great things. Li Bai, a great poet from the Tang Dynasty, always boasted about his intelligence and didn't put much effort into his studies. One day, he skipped school and wandered to a stream where he saw an old lady holding a piece of iron, grinding it on a large stone. Li Bai asked, Ma'am, what are you grinding that iron for? The old lady replied, I am making a hairpin for my daughter. Surprised, Li Bai asked, How can that rough, coarse iron become a hairpin? The old lady said, With enough effort, even this piece of iron can become a hairpin. Deeply moved by her words, Li Bai returned home and began to study diligently, eventually becoming a renowned poet whose fame has lasted for centuries. 56. Always leave yourself a way out to avoid regrets. Delicious and rich foods are essentially poisons that can harm your health. If you only eat until you are satisfied and not overly full, your stomach won't be harmed. Pleasing others with things that are easy on the eyes and ears can lead to downfall. Enjoying these pleasures in moderation will prevent future regrets. During the Warring States period, philosophers Mozi and Yang Ju wanted to organize a grand debate, and many people rushed to attend. However, one person, named Mencius, showed no interest in it. His students asked him, Why don't you go and listen to the debate? Mencius replied, I already know the outcome of the debate, so why waste my time attending? Curious, his students then asked, Who will win and who will lose between Mozi and Yang Zhu? Mencius answered, Neither will win nor lose. Yang Zhu values himself too much and even for the great benefit of the world, he wouldn't sacrifice even a single hair. What use is such a person in this world? On the other hand, Mozi advocates universal love, and even if it means suffering severe injuries, he would endure it for the world's benefit. What meaning does such a life have? 
I advocate moderation and balance, not leaning too much to one side like Yang Zhu or the other like Mozi. Knowing the middle way, acting only when it is beneficial and refraining otherwise, therefore, Mencius wins. 57. The basis of peace is ordinary virtue. Sly schemes, bad habits, and peculiar abilities are all sources of disaster in human interactions. Simply possessing moral qualities and speaking and acting with normal caution can not only improve one's character but also bring peace. During the Western Jin Dynasty, Yang Hu, also known as Xu Qi, was in charge of the critical border town of Xiangyang, managing the military and ensuring the people's well-being, fully understanding the heart of the people in Jiangchuan. He often wore plain clothes, seldom donned armor or helmets, and was guarded by no more than ten people. Always accompanying Yang Hu was the great general of the state of Wu Lu Kang. Despite Wu being an enemy state, Yang Hu treated Lu Kang with utmost sincerity, frequently inquiring about his well-being and never planning surprise attacks against Wu. Those who attempted to plot against him were met with Yang Hu's foresight. He would serve them fine wine, intoxicating them into silence. In one year when Jin lacked food supplies, they were forced to harvest a little from Wu, for which Yang Hu compensated with silk of equivalent value. When hunting, Yang Hu never crossed the border, and any wounded animals caught by W.U.'s forces that Jin retrieved were checked and returned in full to Wu. Because of Yang Hu's sincere dealings with Wu, he maintained long-lasting peace on the border. 58. Don't boast about your abilities or rely too much on what you have. People blessed with intelligence are meant to teach and enlighten others who may not be as fortunate. However, some intelligent individuals boast about their talents and mock the flaws of others. Those who are wealthy should help those in poverty, but some wealthy people oppress the poor using their resources. Both types of behavior deserve punishment. The story of Yan Zi, an envoy from the state of Qi to the state of Chu, illustrates this point. The rulers of Chu, knowing Yan Zi was short, made a small hole next to the main gate for him to enter, teasing him about his stature. Yan Zi stood before the hole and said, This is a dog hole, not a gate. I am an envoy to Chu, not to a land of dogs. Which country am I entering, Chu or the land of dogs? The people of Chu had no answer and had to open the main gate for him. When confronted by the king of Chu, who mockingly asked if Qi had no one else to send, Yan Zi calmly replied that a great nation sends its best envoys, while a lesser state sends its least capable. He admitted he was the least valued in Qi, and that's why he was sent. The king of Chu was deeply embarrassed. Yan Zi's mission to Chu shows that many who think they are smart are actually foolish and those who try to belittle others only end up tarnishing their own reputation. 59. True Leadership, the Wisdom of Laozi on Integrity and Skill True integrity does not seek fame. The most skillful are those who don't show off. Genuinely honest people do not care about being recognized for their integrity. Those who seek a reputation for integrity often do so to cover up their own greed with that reputation. Truly, talented individuals don't randomly boast or reveal their abilities. Those who often brag about their skills are usually trying to hide their own incompetence with that fame. There was once a person named Yang Ziju who asked Lao Zi a question. Sir, there's someone who is both courageous and sharp, and also studies hard. Can this person be considered an ideal manager? Laozi replied, Such people often suffer because of their talents, ultimately exhausting both their mind and body. They overthink and overwork, much like a tiger that attracts hunters because of its large, beautifully patterned body and glossy fur, 
or a monkey that's agile and skilled, or a hunting dog that's good at chasing and thus is captured and restrained by humans. Yangtze Zhu then asked, So, what does an ideal manager look like according to you, sir? Laozi answered, A truly ideal public servant is someone who deeply connects with the people, leaves a lasting legacy of goodwill for future generations, and does so in a way that seems unrelated to them personally. When such a person governs, they leave no trace of their political actions. They are masterful with tactics, yet appear very straightforward. Only then can they be considered a truly ideal manager. 60. Wisdom in Crisis – The Strategic Sacrifice of Prince Jia When giving feedback, don't be too harsh, and when teaching, don't set expectations too high. It's important to consider whether the person can acknowledge their mistakes when criticizing them. Also, when instructing someone on how to do good, make sure the expectations are reasonable and attainable so they don't feel overwhelmed. In 265 BC, after the death of King Zhao Hui Wen, his son, King Xiao Cheng, ascended to the throne as a young child. His mother, Queen Dowager Zhao, took over the state affairs. Seeing the political instability in Zhao due to the young king, the powerful state of Qin attacked. Zhao sought help from the state of Qi, which demanded that Zhao send his beloved son, Prince Jia, as a hostage before they would send military aid. The Queen Dowager initially refused, and when her ministers tried to persuade her, she angrily declared that she would spit in the face of anyone who continued to advise her on this matter. At that time, Zhu Long, who was serving as the left minister, requested to speak with the Queen Dowager. He subtly advised her by comparing the situation to historical princes who, despite their high status and numerous treasures, achieved nothing significant. He suggested that if she overly protected Prince Jia without allowing him to undertake significant responsibilities, his future in Zhao would be precarious. Realizing the truth in Xu Long's words, the Queen Dowager agreed to send Prince Jia to Qi as a hostage. As promised, Qi then helped Zhao defeat Qin, and the crisis was averted. 61. Adapt to your true nature and live like the common folk. People of high status often feel a sense of admiration when they see how content the ordinary folk are. The elite, when in a simple environment, invariably feel a sense of peace and reluctance to leave such comfort behind. Given this, why should people waste their efforts chasing wealth and status instead of living a life that suits their true nature? During the Eastern Jin Dynasty, Wang Shiji, a master calligrapher renowned for his strong character and skill in regular script, was greatly admired by his uncles, Wang Dun and Wang Dao. When the regent, He Yan, sent a servant to Wang Dao's house to find a suitable son-in-law, Wang Dao directed him to a room in the east to see his nephew. Upon returning, the servant reported to He Yan, All of Wang's sons were decent, but while they all acted very proper knowing I came to choose a son-in-law, only one man lay on his bed eating rice, seemingly unaware of the matter. Hearing this, he Yan decided, that's exactly the kind of son-in-law I want. He later discovered that man was Wang Shiji, to whom he happily married his daughter. 62. Avoid pointing out others' shortcomings. Gently guide the stubborn. When it comes to people's shortcomings, it's wise to help them improve subtly. Criticizing or ridiculing them only highlights your own flaws and shows your own imperfections. If someone is being stubborn, they should be advised gently. Getting angry or resentful only encourages their stubbornness with your own. During the Song Dynasty, two famous scholars, Zhang Ying and Ku Jun, were close friends. When Zhang Ying took a local government position in the capital, 
he heard Ku Jun was about to be appointed as the prime minister. Zhang mentioned to his colleagues and subordinates, Ku Jun is a rare talent, but unfortunately, he isn't well educated. Later, when Ku Jun was dismissed from his role as prime minister, which coincided with Zhang Ying also being relieved from his position, Zhang visited Ku at his home and was treated with great respect. Upon leaving, Ku accompanied Zhang to the outskirts of the city and asked, Do you have any advice for me? Calmly, Zhang Ying quoted a phrase from the Annals of Emperor Guangwu in the History of the Han Dynasty, which Ku did not understand at first. When he went home and read the phrase, uneducated, no technique, from the book, he laughed and said, Is Zhang referring to me? Although Zhang Ying wanted to critique Ku Jun's lack of education and its effects, he didn't point it out directly, allowing Ku to realize it on his own. This method preserved Ku's dignity while still being educational. 63. Pure Heart, Positive Thoughts A person with a pure and just heart will feel at peace anywhere, even in the darkest places. On the other hand, someone with evil intentions will feel like they are in hell, even under the brightest skies. During the reign of Emperor Ming of the Ming Dynasty, Prince Zhou Shanhao rebelled. Eunuchs Zhang Zhang and Zhou Tai persuaded the emperor to lead the military personally, seizing the opportunity to manipulate him. However, soon after, Wang Shu Ren, the leader who quelled the rebellion, announced their victory and the capture of Zhou Shanhao. Seeing their plans failing, Zhang Zhang and his cohort vented their anger on Wang Shu Ren. They spread false rumors that Wang Shu Ren was an ally of the rebel prince and encouraged soldiers to insult him, even disrespecting his official insignia to create chaos. Wang Shu Ren, however, did not react hastily. He treated his officers with respect and instructed his people to temporarily move away from their homes, leaving only the elderly to watch over the houses, to avoid further chaos. Eventually, Zhang Zhang and his followers found no reason to cause trouble. Wang Shu Ren, with his clear conscience and sincere heart, endured humiliation to fulfill his duties and treated everyone with honesty. This truly exemplifies the right way to handle situations. 64. Wu Zetian, The Power of Magnanimity and Strategic Benevolence in dirty places, many creatures tend to thrive, whereas clear streams seldom support any fish growth. True gentlemen with virtue should be able to embrace others' flaws and forgive their mistakes, never deeming themselves superior. The only female emperor in Chinese history, Wu Zetian, was both autocratic and magnanimous. She did good for others especially without harboring personal grudges, leaving a deep impression on later generations. According to historical records, soon after Wu Zetian ascended to the throne, a rebellious woman named Shang Guan Wanner, deeply resentful because her parents had been killed, confronted Wu Zetian with a poem that criticized her for disrupting traditional gender roles and morals. Instead of responding with hatred or persecution, Wu Zetian saw this criticism as a strategy to remind herself to stay vigilant. She invited Shang Guan Wanner to the palace to supervise her work, demonstrating great tolerance. This approach deeply moved Shang Guan Wanner, who became a sincere supporter of Wu Zetian's reign. Wu Zetian's open-heartedness and strategic benevolence helped her rule successfully during a prosperous time for her country. 65. Treat old friends well and respect the elderly. When you reunite with old friends, treat them with the same warmth and enthusiasm as you would when meeting new friends. Handle any small, confidential matters with honesty and integrity. When interacting with the elderly, always show deep respect and consideration. 
During the Three Kingdoms period in the late era of Chao Wei, the clans of Cao and Sima were fiercely competing for control, causing great chaos in the government. Many talented individuals, preferring not to be involved in such turmoil, chose to retreat into nature to find solace. Among them were seven famous scholars, Ngu Yen Teach, K. E. Kong, Son Dao, Huang Tu, Lu Lin, Ngu Yen Ham, and Vuong Hong. They often wandered in bamboo forests, drinking wine, writing poetry and playing music, seeking peace amidst the chaos. They are historically known as the Seven Sages of the Bamboo Grove. At that time, although descendants of Cao Cao were emperors, the real political power was held by the Prime Minister Sima Zhao, who sought to expand his influence by recruiting well-known figures, including the Seven Sages. He first invited Sun Dao to join the government. Unable to refuse, Sun Dao accepted. Later, Sun Dao recommended K. E. Kong for a position without consulting him first, which greatly upset K. E. Kong. K. E. Kong wrote a letter to Sun Dao, not only expressing his displeasure but also severely criticizing the Sima clan's rule at that time. Knowing K. E. Kong's honest and upright nature, Sun Dao didn't take offense, and instead, their friendship grew even stronger. 66. Generosity leads to abundant blessings. Pettiness leads to scant fortune. Kind and charitable people with a generous spirit can receive plentiful and lasting blessings and always show a magnanimous attitude. Whereas, narrow-minded, shallow, and ignorant people may find their blessings to be fragile and fleeting, always displaying the demeanor of someone with a short-sighted and narrow view. During the Eastern Han Dynasty, Ban Chao was sent as an envoy to the Western regions, where he built a reputable name. The imperial court appointed him to govern these regions, and later sent a man named Guo Ye to escort envoys from the Western regions back to the capital. Guo Ye, showing no respect, insulted Ban Chao, accusing him of marrying a local woman and enjoying life with beautiful women in the western regions, with no intention of returning. The emperor, aware of Ban Chao's loyalty, sternly reprimanded Guo Ye, saying, Even if Ban Chao did as you say, selecting beautiful women, the Han soldiers numbering over a thousand, how could they unite so closely with Ban Chao? He then issued an edict to Ban Chao. If Guo Ye takes a post in the western regions, keep him as your subordinate. Ban Chao promptly sent Guo Ye back to the capital with the hostages. Someone told Ban Chao, Guo Ye previously insulted you and wanted to harm our operations in the western regions. Why not keep him here as the edict suggested and send someone else with the hostages? Ban Chao replied, Why would I harbor such harmful intentions? It's precisely because Guo Ye insulted me that I let him go. I'm not ashamed in my heart, so why should I care what others say? Keeping him here for a moment of satisfaction is not the act of a gentleman. 67. The virtuous focus on character, the petty on profit. A virtuous person diligently focuses on improving their moral character, but some people use this diligence to address their poverty instead. Those who are simple and frugal usually don't care about fame or profit and live modestly with material wealth. However, some people use frugality as an excuse to cover up their stinginess. Unfortunately, the most valuable method of self-improvement for the virtuous becomes a tool for the petty to pursue profit. During the time of Emperor Yuan of Han, there was a queen named Wang Zhengjun who had a nephew called Wang Mang. He was very skilled at presenting himself well, extremely respectful and devoted to his mother and took great care of widows and orphans. In front of respected uncles, he was exceedingly polite and respectful, which earned him a high reputation. After Emperor Yuan's death, Wang Mang used his position as an external relative to take control of the government. 
He won people's favor by granting minor titles and favors to high-ranking officials, took good care of the imperial family, expanded schools, and attracted talented scholars from all over. He also provided financial aid and land to people in regions affected by disasters and personally led a frugal and vegetarian lifestyle. He lightened punishments and protected women. Both the officials and the common people were moved by his actions and actively promoted his virtues, leading to widespread praise for him and calls for his promotion at court. When the time was right, Wang Mang quickly dropped his facade. In the eighth year of the Common Era, he seized the throne from the Han Dynasty and established a new empire, leading to the fall of the Western Han government. 68. Warning people can save lives and is an incredibly virtuous act. A wise man who understands the principles of morality from reading the teachings of the saints knows that in times of poverty, when he can't help others with money or material things, if he encounters ignorant or deluded people, just warning them with a word can make a big difference. Likewise, if he meets someone in danger, helping them with just a word is also an incredibly virtuous deed. During the spring and autumn period, the great thinker, Confucius went to the state of Chu to learn about their rituals. There, he met Laozi. Confucius asked Laozi about the Chu's customs, and Laozi explained everything in great detail. After finishing his inquiries, when Confucius was about to leave, Laozi saw him off and said, I've heard that wealthy people often give gifts when seeing off guests, and virtuous people give wise words. I'm not rich, so I'll use the method of the virtuous and give you these words. Intelligent people who are meticulous often face danger because they like to criticize others. Wise people, skilled in debate and knowledgeable, also face risks because they expose the wrongdoings of others. As a son, one should not only think of oneself but also consider one's parents. As a subject, one should not just focus on oneself but also think of the ruler. Confucius found this advice very useful. At a time when Confucius was still uncertain, Laozi pointed out the errors in his ways, which is the highest form of virtue. 69. Balancing Closeness and Distance Confucius on True Virtue and Deception In dealing with others, it's important to neither be too close nor too distant. If you don't share the same low standards as some vulgar and inferior groups, you also shouldn't act as if you are morally superior. Your actions should not make others feel envious or resentful, and you shouldn't intentionally join in the celebrations of those you dislike. Confucius particularly despised those who pretended to be honest and simple to deceive others. He called such people thieves of morality because they undermine ethical standards. This view has profound implications and is sometimes hard to understand. During the Warring States period, Mencius, a student of Confucius, was asked by his student Wan Zhang to define such people. Mencius explained that these individuals often appear very satisfied and constantly flatter others and thus are insincere. Wan Zhang, still confused, asked why Confucius would say such people are corrupting morality when everyone in their hometown praises them as good and their actions seem genuinely noble. Mencius replied that the nature of these individuals is such that you cannot find any significant flaws to criticize or anything terrible enough to insult. They just drift along with the times, appearing honest and righteous, but are far from the moral ideals of ancient sage kings. Thus, Confucius labeled them as destroyers of morality. 70. Accumulate good deeds. Avoid craving for power and high positions. Ordinary people who try to accumulate good deeds and do good with all their abilities are respected by others, even without high titles or prestigious positions. In contrast, 
high-ranking officials who are consumed by greed for power and seek favoritism may have titles, but they are as pitiful as beggars. The virtuous scholar Tron Trong, who lived during the Warring States period, came from the noble Dian family. His brother, a high-ranking official in the state of Ti, was granted land in Kai Ap, earning a vast income annually. Growing up in a noble family, Tran Trong saw the corruption and moral decay within the noble class and the brutal exploitation of peasants. He despised his brother, who, for luxury and wealth, compromised his soul, openly engaging in bribery and ignoring moral principles. Recognizing his inability to change society, Tran Trong chose to cut ties with his brother in his youth. Initially, he retreated to Mount Ngi Son, but still received visits from officials, which disturbed his peace. Eventually, he moved to the picturesque Mount Truong Bak, where he cultivated crops and provided for himself, living a tranquil life away from worldly strife. 71. Good deeds quietly grow while evil silently fades away. Doing good may not immediately show its benefits, but the results of good deeds grow quietly like a squash hidden in the grass, eventually sprouting on its own. Doing wrong might not show immediate harm, but it's like the snow left in the yard during spring which melts away when the sun rises. General Dao Khan from the Eastern Jin period grew up in poverty. After his father passed away from a serious illness, his family depended solely on his mother who spun and wove fabric to make a living. She raised him with great dedication. At the age of 16, his mother managed to secure him a small official position in the district. Shortly after taking office, he gave his mother a basket of fish. Upon receiving it, his mother covered the basket and not only refused to eat the fish, but also scolded Dao Khan, saying, Using your official position to bring home public goods for your mother brings neither benefit nor joy, but only adds to my sorrow. This had a profound educational impact on Dao Khan. His mother's honest, hard-working, and simple lifestyle profoundly shaped his own life values, helping him maintain his integrity and simplicity throughout his life. The story of Dao's mother teaching her son has been passed down through generations. 72. From gentle to firm, starting strict, ending kind. When dealing with others, it's wise to go from gentle to firm. If you start out overly generous and warm but gradually become indifferent, people will easily forget your kindness. To build a solid reputation, you should start off being strict and then become more forgiving and benevolent. If you initially act benevolent and then become strict, people may resent your harshness. A famous military strategist and general during the early years of ancient China, Sima Yan, initially held a lowly position. After being promoted, he worried that his humble origins would make his soldiers disrespect him. Concerned that they wouldn't obey his commands, he requested that Qi Jinggong replace him with Zhang Zai, a man of higher status and more respected. Sima Yan invited Zhang Zai to a military meeting the following day, but Zhang Zai arrived late. Without showing favoritism, Sima Yan adhered to military rules and executed Zhang Zai in front of the troops, announcing it throughout the forces. This act significantly boosted Sima Yan's authority, instilling fear and respect among the officers and soldiers, and tightened military discipline. After establishing his authority, Sima Yan began to adopt a more comforting and caring approach towards his soldiers, taking an interest in their well-being and managing military affairs, which further earned their admiration and love. 73. The Artist's Lesson, A Cautionary Tale of Humility and Prudence Being frugal is generally a good trait, but being too frugal can turn into stinginess. This might hurt other people's feelings when you socialize. Being humble is admirable, but too much humility can appear as 
overly cautious, or even sycophantic, which might make others suspect you have ulterior motives. During the Northern Song Dynasty, there was a famous painter named Sun Ji Wei, who excelled in painting people. Once, he was asked to paint a piece called The Nine Heavenly Generals. He put his heart into the painting, making the figures lifelike and almost divine. Just as he was about to add color, a friend invited him for a drink. He told his students, I've finished the outlines. Just be careful when adding the colors. After he left, the students gathered around the painting, discussing it eagerly. One student, Dong Yini, who often boasted about his cleverness, noticed that unlike usual, Sun hadn't painted a fresh flower in a vase in the picture. He suggested hastily adding one and painted a beautiful pink lotus at the vase's mouth. When Sun Ji Wei returned and saw the added lotus, he laughed and was a bit upset, saying, Who made this foolish addition? If it were just adding an extra leg to a snake, it would be one thing. But you've turned a powerful enchanted vase into a plain one, turning it into a joke for everyone. He then tore up the painting. This version keeps the essence of the original content, but uses straightforward language and context that would be more familiar to an American audience. 74. Living a life unconcerned with fame and wealth. Studying poetry and literature without truly understanding the deep thoughts of the ancient sages turns one into a mere copier. Being a government official who doesn't care for the people is like a robber dressed in official robes. Talking about education without applying it to oneself is like a monk who chants scriptures without understanding the teachings of Buddhism. Building a career without thinking about doing good deeds is like a night-blooming Sirius that quickly withers. Hai Thuy of the Ming Dynasty was a famously honest official in Chinese history. He was upright and treated the people as his own children, making him deeply respected and loved by the public. His subordinates feared his authority, and corrupt individuals often resigned on their own. There was a powerful family that usually painted their doors red, but they changed them to black when they heard Hai Thuy was coming. Hai Thuy was adamant about reforms and ordered the clearing of the Ngotung River, which benefited the people greatly. He despised the wealthy landowners and strongly criticized them while comforting the poor. The poor, whose lands were seized by the rich, had their properties returned thanks to him. He issued orders decisively and firmly, causing local officials to comply strictly out of fear and concern, with some tyrants even fleeing to other regions. Later, someone accused Hai Thuy of protecting commoners and oppressing officials, causing disruption. As a result, the emperor demoted him. When the people heard of his demotion, they wept bitterly, and some even kept his portrait in their homes to honor him. A supervisory official once visited him, and finding Hai Thuy's home almost empty except for a bed, sighed and left. Hai Thuy was truly an official of integrity. 75. Evil people using knowledge to fuel their wickedness. Only those with a pure heart and mind can truly appreciate poetry and learn the great virtues of the wise and virtuous. Otherwise, a person might take a good deed and secretly use it to satisfy their personal desires or hear a wise saying and use it as an excuse to cover up their own faults. Such actions are like arming an enemy or supplying a thief with provisions. Ngayem Tung was a notorious corrupt official in Chinese history. After becoming the deputy prime minister during the Ming dynasty under Emperor Jia Jing, he abused his power, engaged in bribery, and committed numerous evil acts for 15 years. Despite his unethical behavior, he was talented in poetry and deeply knowledgeable in literature. In the 16th year of Jia Jing, when the capital sky was filled with colorful clouds, which Taoist priests declared a sign of national peace, Niam Tung took this opportunity to devote himself to writing a poem, Respect for the Clouds, 
to present to Emperor Jia Jing. The emperor found every word of the poem elegant and refined, and it was highly praised by the court officials. The more Jia Jing read, the more he admired it, quickly applauding its beauty. Encouraged by this praise, Nangyem Tung soon wrote another poem, Grand Ceremony of Creation, which the emperor also admired greatly, describing every word as precious and exquisite. From then on, Emperor Jia Jing saw Nanyem Tung in a new light, favoring him more deeply. Consequently, Yinqiem Tung's influence soared, eventually dominating the political scene. 76. When the mind is empty, it understands truth. When the mind is occupied, it rejects desires. To be a good person, one must be humble. Only through modesty and caution can one see things clearly. To be a good person, one must also be strong and resolute, as only with a strong will can one resist the temptations of fame and profit. During the spring and autumn period, a famous general from the state of Qi, Quan Zhong, fell seriously ill. The Duke of Qi visited him personally. Their conversation turned to choosing Quan Zhong's successor enlightening those who heard it. The duke asked, Among my ministers, who could serve as general? Quan Zhong replied, Your majesty knows best. The duke asked about Bao Xu Ya, and Quan Zhong said, Bao Xu Ya is honest and upright, a true gentleman, but he is too black and white about right and wrong. Once he knows someone's faults, he can't forget them. This weakness disqualifies him as a general. Then the duke asked about Zheng Bang, to which Quan Zhong responded, Zheng Bang sets high standards for himself, isn't afraid to learn from what he can do, and shows empathy towards those less capable. However, he shouldn't manage state affairs as he doesn't seek advice on crucial matters and asks too many questions about trivial ones. He also tends to overlook others' mistakes. It would be reluctant to make Zheng Bang a general. Although Duke of Qi did not follow Quan Zhong's advice, Zheng Bang's reputation for humility and eagerness to learn has been remembered for generations. 77. Forget about fame and focus deeply when studying. When engaging in intellectual work, it's essential to focus wholeheartedly and put all your effort into the research. If you're cultivating your morals but still preoccupied with success and reputation, you won't achieve true mastery. Similarly, if you read books merely to appear learned without genuine interest, your knowledge will lack deep roots. A famous calligrapher from the Tang dynasty, Huai Su, was renowned for his cursive writing. As a young boy, he followed his uncle into a monastic life. Later, he went to practice further and studied under the Sage of Cursive, Zhang Xu. Huai Su was very dedicated to practicing his writing. He would wake up before dawn to grind ink and clean his brushes. Due to poverty and unable to afford paper, he grew banana trees at his residence, using the leaves as his practice sheets. Ultimately, he became a celebrated calligrapher. It is said that Huai Su enjoyed drinking wine, and after becoming intoxicated, his writing would flow dynamically like a storm with graceful and powerful strokes, earning him a reputation for his wild cursive style. People called Zhang Xu Mad Zhang and Huai Su followed as Second Madman, together known as Mad Zhang and Drunken Su. 78. Be serious in actions cautious in social interactions. Teaching students should be as careful as taking care of a young woman in her private quarters. The most important aspect is to strictly manage their lives, paying attention to the friends they make. Once they associate with friends of poor moral character, it's like planting a bad seed in rich, fertile soil. Ultimately, the seed will not thrive. During the Warring States period, the representative figure of the Confucian school was Mencius. He lost his father at a young age and was raised by his widowed mother. Initially, they lived in Fu Village, near a cemetery, 
where his mother made a living weaving fabric. Mencius often saw funerals and burials and would play funeral games with his friends at the cemetery. His mother felt that living there was not suitable, so she moved their home to a business district. This area had a slaughterhouse, and Mencius began imitating the butchers. This worried his mother even more, so she moved again, this time to Ox City. Their new home was near a school, so Mencius found joy in following others in reading books. Finally, his mother settled down, reassured. Through diligent study, Mencius later became a renowned scholar known as the Second Sage. His success was due to his mother's methodical approach to education. 79. Stay calm during family crises. Be honest about friends' mistakes. When facing crises with your siblings, parents, or relatives, it's important to stay calm and not react too harshly. When interacting with friends, if mistakes occur, you should advise them sincerely and not ignore their errors since they are responsible for them. During the Three Kingdoms period, a great general of the Wu Kingdom, Lu Meng, had been a soldier since his youth and spent half his life in battle without ever studying formally. Once Sun Quan, the ruler of Wu, told Lu Meng and another general, Zhang Kong, that they were managing local affairs and should study to improve their ability to handle their duties. Lu Meng responded that the army kept him too busy to study. Sun Quan advised him, Are you busier than I am? I find studying very beneficial. Influenced by this advice, Lu Meng decided to change. He started a class to attract knowledgeable people to study with him, discuss, and elevate their understanding of military strategies and history. More importantly, he became very dedicated to his studies, tirelessly learning more than even those who specialized in Confucian studies. 80. If you don't fully engage and grasp the essence of what you're doing, how can you find true joy? Most people only understand books written with words, but they don't know how to read the unwritten books of the universe. They only play instruments with strings and miss out on the natural music of the world without strings. If they only focus on the physical forms of things, they can't truly appreciate their captivating aspects. So how can they understand the real fun in playing music or reading? Truong Huk, an exceptional calligrapher from the Tang Dynasty in ancient China, understood this deeply. He gained insights into the spiritual essence of calligraphy by observing the posture and movements of laborers and by listening to the rhythm of music. Watching a sword dance by the artist Kong Ton, he grasped the dynamic blend of strength and gentleness in calligraphy, elevating his art to a profound level. Truong Huk also loved to drink. When drunk, he would shout and run wildly, then write calligraphy using his head dipped in ink. When sober, he found his drunken writings mystically perfect, yet impossible to replicate when sober. He was affectionately called Crazy Truong by those around him. The great Tang dynasty poet Do Fu once wrote about him. After three cups of wine, Crazy Truong would reveal divine calligraphy, hatless and carefree before the duke, his strokes as fleeting as clouds and mist. 81. Literature should accurately reflect natural virtues. Great literature is simply about expressing natural thoughts and emotions to the fullest. The highest level of moral cultivation is just about displaying the inherent goodness of human nature. The Tang Dynasty artist Han Gan was exceptionally skilled at painting horses. Han Gan grew up in poverty, working as a server in a tavern. One day, while waiting for the poet Wang Wei to pay his tab, Han Gan began drawing on the ground out of boredom. Wang Wei saw this and was impressed by the boy's talent, so he decided to financially support Han Gan's art education every year. After more than 10 years of practice, Han Gan became an expert, especially in painting horses, 
creating some of the most beautiful horse paintings in the world. In the first year of the Tianbao era, he was summoned to the palace, where someone asked him how he mastered his art. He replied, Being a good person is all about embracing your true nature. Writing great literature is about capturing that nature in its purest form. The same goes for painting horses. I just paint them as they naturally are. Everyone agreed that his explanation made sense. 82. Ethics and education need to be focused on in every matter. Truth is something everyone seeks and pursues, and it can vary according to each person's character, enhancing guidance. Being an intellectual, at the end of the Warring States period, there was a prime minister in the state of Zheng named Zi Shan, whose methods of governance were quite unique. He never increased the suppression of public speech, even from those who were unhappy with Zheng's ruling policies, who sometimes even mocked them. At that time, Zheng had many schools called village schools that nurtured intellectuals. However, these schools also became gathering places for those dissatisfied with the political regime, using them as venues for political activity and venting their grievances. Some senior officials suggested closing the village schools. Zishan argued, actually, there's no need to close the village schools. The people gather there to debate politics, and there's nothing blameworthy in that. We can consider their opinions on political matters. If we suppress them too harshly, it's like blocking the flow of water. The pressure might be contained temporarily, but soon a great flood will break through the dams causing floods. It's better to let it flow gradually, guiding it naturally and increasing guidance, and then the world will be well governed. 83. Don't just believe one side. Don't rely solely on your strengths. You shouldn't blindly trust biased opinions and be deceived by dishonest people. Also, don't think you are always right and let your emotions push you. Don't compare your strengths with others' weaknesses. And don't envy others' talents because of your own shortcomings. During the spring and autumn period when the Duke Wu of Qin was sick, he called the famous doctor Bian Kuei to treat him. After diagnosing the Duke through the four methods, listening, observing, asking, touching, Bian Kuei said, This illness can be treated. Please rest assured and let me take care of it. However, a close advisor to the Duke told him, The illness is between your ear and eye, and even with treatment, it might not fully heal. If it doesn't, you could become deaf or blind. When Duke Wu told Bian Kui what the advisor said, Bian Kui was very upset, threw a sharpening stone on the ground and angrily said, How can your illness be cured if you discuss medical treatments with a knowledgeable doctor, but choose to believe the slander of a dishonest person? If you govern your state this way, only listening to the deceitful words of the wicked, the state of kin will surely face destruction 84. Life is unpredictable and should not be wasted. Heaven and earth may last forever, but a human life is brief, lasting only about a hundred years. If you have a happy life, cherish the joy it brings and avoid dwelling on worries and sadness, as this can waste your entire life. Ban Chao, a notable figure during the Eastern Han Dynasty, was a man of great ambition who didn't sweat the small stuff. He was eloquent and well-read. Later, his brother Ban Gu was appointed to a governmental position, and Ban Chao, along with their mother, moved to the capital city of Luoyang. Coming from a poor background, Ban Chao often wrote books for government officials to support his elderly mother, a task that was both time-consuming and arduous. Once, while taking a break from writing, still holding his pen, he lamented, how can a man with no great ambition at least not seek to achieve what Fo Jio or Zhang Qian did, earning honors abroad? How can one just sit by the study table wasting his youth? Those around him laughed. Ban Chao responded, Ordinary people can't understand my ambitions. 
He later consulted a fortune teller who predicted that, although he was ordinary then, one day he would be rewarded with vast lands. Indeed, Ban Chao eventually made significant contributions to his country. 85. Use virtue to guide talent, ensuring both are complete. Moral character should lead talented individuals, while talent itself should serve moral character. Someone with talent but lacking moral character is like a house without a homeowner, allowing the servant to take control, inevitably causing chaos and disorder. During the Eastern Han Dynasty, there was a scholar named Wang Dong who was both talented and honest. Once, he found a dying scholar in an abandoned house in the capital. The scholar gave him ten pounds of gold, asking him to handle his funeral arrangements. Wang Dong meticulously took care of the funeral and buried the remaining gold with the scholar's coffin. Later, while walking, Wang Dong encountered a horse blocking his path and a silk fabric on the ground. He reported this to the local magistrate, who declared that the horse and silk belonged to him. Later, Wang Dong rode the horse to a neighboring county and by chance met the owner of the horse and silk, returning them. He was even more pleased to learn that the scholar he had buried was the son of the horse's owner. The owner was immensely grateful, praising Wang Dong as a person of both talent and virtue. 86. Maintain strict discipline and integrity. Do not follow the crowd. Educated individuals with significant positions and power must know how to restrain themselves and preserve their ethical integrity, maintaining a modest and gentle demeanor. They should not abandon their personal principles, form cliques, or associate with dishonest people for personal gain, nor should they be so extreme as to offend deceitful individuals they encounter. During the transition from the Wei to the Jin Dynasty, Yang Hu was appointed as the military governor of Jingzhou, holding complete control over the political and military affairs in the region. Stationed in Xiangyang, he built supply depots to prepare for the conquest of the state of Wu. Despite several military campaigns, he was unable to achieve his goal of destroying Wu until his deathbed at the age of 57. He recommended Du Yu to succeed him in assisting Emperor Wu of Jin, Sima Yan, who eventually conquered Wu and unified the country. Therefore, Emperor Wu was deeply moved by remembering Yang Hu's contributions. Yang Hu, who was related to Emperor Wu and took over some confidential duties from W. Yu's father, Sima Zhao, was noted for his uprightness never breaking the law for personal reasons. He famously said, Though I serve in a public office, I stay thousands of miles away from any personal affair. I will not engage in corruption or bribery. This statement stood as firm as gold, and he lived by these words, setting a shining example for future generations. 87. Concealing one's abilities is key to handling major responsibilities. The posture of a hawk standing with half-closed eyes, seemingly asleep, and the relaxed, leisurely walk of a fierce tiger as if it were ill are actually preparations for deploying their most cunning strategies to catch prey. A virtuous person knows how to discreetly show their intelligence, not openly displaying their talents, as this strength allows them to shoulder great responsibilities. Duong Qian, a powerful figure in the northern Zhou dynasty, later known as Emperor Wen of Sui, was a man with a regal appearance, a far-reaching gaze, and the character King on the palm of his hand, signifying his discreet and dignified nature. Wu Van Xian, a prince of northern Zhou, told the emperor, Duong Qian's extraordinary demeanor suggests he will not submit to others. It's best to eliminate him quickly. The emperor, already suspicious of Duong Qian, felt his doubts grow upon hearing this. Unsure whether to act immediately or wait for a better opportunity, he sought advice from his senior official Lai Hoa, 
who also acknowledged Duong Qian's remarkable qualities but secretly wanted to preserve a way out for him, falsely claiming, Duong Qian is very trustworthy. If you make him a general and send him to fight against the state of Tron, he would face an indefensible position. This advice was meant to spare Duong Qian from imminent danger. Upon learning of the emperor's intentions, Duong Qian became extremely fearful, and from then on, he concealed his abilities to avoid arousing further suspicion. 88. Don't make your hobbies in life too numerous, but not too few either. People who think carefully and in detail about everything usually do well for themselves and treat others well too. They always want to present themselves in an elegant and dignified manner. On the other hand, those who take a casual approach to everything not only are very strict with themselves but also with others, making things dull and less enjoyable, lacking vitality. After Liu Bang, the founder of the Han Dynasty, conquered the empire, he rewarded his loyal followers. He granted 30,000 households to his aide, Zhang Liang, who had helped him win the empire. However, Zhang Liang declined, saying, When I first met His Majesty in Liu County, just being awarded land in Liu County would be enough for me. At that time, after the chaos of war, there were no more than 10,000 households left in Liu County. Later, as Liu Bang became emperor and entered the Hangu Pass, Zhang Liang chose to live a quiet life at home, seldom leaving his house. He said, I deceived the emperor's trust to hold the position of military advisor, but my intention was only to secure 10,000 households. Now, this is the highest treatment I could have received, and I am very satisfied. I just want to escape the mundane world and pursue becoming an immortal. Therefore, people praised him as having become a deity. Zhang Liang was a man skilled in distinguishing right from wrong and understood principles. He chose to step back after his success. 89. In simplicity, we find true flavor. In the ordinary, we discover the extraordinary. Strong alcohol, fatty meats, sour lemons, and sweet oranges are not truly fine flavors. Real delicacy is something light and gentle. People whose actions stand out are not necessarily virtuous. Truly moral people often seem just like anyone else. Fam Wong, a scholar from the Jin dynasty, came from a distinguished family, but his father died early and their family fortune declined. He relied on his mother to get by, and life was extremely tough. His mother was cultured and often taught him to read and write herself. Fam Wong was smarter than most, and with his mother's dedicated teaching, he quickly became skilled in calligraphy. To help with everyday expenses, he traveled to find work writing books, keeping them in his room and spending his days writing. Without an oil lamp, he burned wood for light, reading and writing at the same time, memorizing everything he wrote. In his spare time, he never forgot to quietly recite the scriptures he had copied. This method of copying books made Fam Wong a scholar with knowledge beyond others. In his later years, he lived in Jiangyan, where he established a school to revive the local culture and education. Ancient books may seem simple and clear, but if studied and remembered carefully, their essence lasts long and reaches far. Reading books and working can also bring endless joy. 90 honesty in governance, and frugality at home. To be an upright official, there are two old sayings. Only impartial justice can discern right from wrong accurately, and only integrity can build true respect. Managing a household also follows two maxims. Only a tolerant spirit can bring peace and gentleness, and only frugality in spending can ensure prosperity. During the spring and autumn period, a famous general from the state of Qi, Yan Zi, fell seriously ill. As he was dying, he asked someone to carve a hollow in a pillar of his house 
and placed his will inside it. He told his wife, Show this to our son when he grows up. Later, when his son was older, he read the will which said, We cannot do without fabric, as without it we cannot dress properly. However, it shouldn't be excessive. Too much leads to corruption. Oxen and horses are essential, as without them we can't transport or work, but having too many leads to waste. One must be humble. Without humility, respect cannot be earned. A scholar cannot thrive in utter destitution, for then he cannot serve as an official. A country must not fall. If it does, there is nothing left to rely on. 91. The Early Lessons of Mencius The Importance of Persistence in Learning and Character Building If young children do not develop good character, they won't succeed when they grow up. Children are the early versions of adults, just as students are the early versions of officials. However, if they don't train to become skilled and refine their knowledge thoroughly, they will struggle to become useful talents in society later on. Mencius, a thinker from the Warring States period of China, was taken to school by his mother when he was young. Initially, Mencius studied hard, but over time he became lazy and distracted by play. One day, he skipped school and went home. His mother, who was weaving at the time, saw him come back and immediately cut the cloth she was working on in half. Mencius, terrified, knelt down and asked his mother why she did that. She scolded him, saying, the principles of learning and weaving are the same. You need to weave every thread without interruption to create a useful fabric. If you cut it halfway through, all your efforts will be wasted, and you'll end up with nothing but trash. You need to study diligently and continuously to succeed, but now you are lazy and skipping school, indulging in play. How can you succeed in your career like this? Ashamed by his mother's words, Mencius apologized and committed to studying harder. After months of relentless effort, he eventually succeeded both academically and morally. 92. No title, no worries. People often only feel happy when they have fame and status, but they don't realize that true happiness comes from not having any reputation or position. People usually feel sad and worried when they don't have enough food or clothes, yet they fail to see that those who don't need to worry about living in hardship with empty spirits are actually the ones who suffer less. During the Warring States period, the philosopher Zhuangzi survived by fishing on the banks of the Pu River. King Huai of Chu, recognizing Zhuangzi's wisdom and virtue, sent treasures to invite him to become a minister in his court. Zhuangzi asked the envoy, I've heard that King Huai has a sacred turtle that lived over 3,000 years. After its death, its shell was placed in a silver urn at the court as a precious item. Tell me, would the turtle prefer to have died so that its remains could be cherished by others, or would it have preferred to live wagging its tail in the mud? The envoy replied, Of course, it would prefer to live wagging its tail in the mud. Zhuangzi smiled and said, That's right, go back home. I too prefer to live in the mud without any worries or disturbances. Zhuangzi had already realized the joy of living without fame or status. 93. Be diligent when at ease, graceful when busy. It might seem like the natural world is calm and unchanging, but in reality, the moon and the sun are always moving, never stopping. They constantly rotate day and night, yet their light has remained the same forever. Therefore, when a person of noble character has free time, they should stay active, and when they are busy, they should know how to enjoy the pleasant moments of calm. In the year 383, Fu Jian, the emperor of former Qin, led a huge army to attack the Eastern Jin dynasty. The commander of the Eastern Jin forces was the renowned general Ta An. Ta An appointed his nephew Ta Hu Yen as the vanguard admiral to resist Qin. 
Before setting off, Ta Hu Yen visited Ta An to bid farewell and seek battle advice. Surprisingly, Ta An casually replied that he had already made the arrangements. That night, he summoned generals, including Ta Thak and Ta Hu Yen, and gave each of them clear, detailed instructions. Seeing Ta An so composed increased everyone's confidence and joy. They happily returned to their camp. Indeed, the Eastern Jin forces were victorious. The day the news of victory arrived, Ta En was playing chess at home with a guest. After reading the victory letter from Ta Ta, he calmly placed it on the table and continued his game. Only after his guest had left did his joy become apparent. As he walked to the door, he stumbled and kicked off his shoe, breaking a tooth. Truly, he was a master of maintaining tranquility amidst busyness. 94. Peace and simplicity are the ways to understand one's inner self. When you are calm and think clearly, you can truly understand your own nature. When you are at leisure, your relaxed and easygoing manner allows you to grasp the profound truths in your soul. When your mood is calm and gentle, unburdened, you can appreciate the interesting things within your soul. Self-reflection is the best method to realize the fundamental truths of the universe. Long ago in China, there was a highly enlightened monk named Dai Ham. One evening, while he was reading, a robber burst into his house brandishing a knife. The monk calmly pulled out a bag of money from his robe and threw it to the robber, saying, Take all this money and go. As the robber clutched the money and was about to flee, the monk called out, Wait a moment. The robber froze in terror. The monk then said, Don't forget to close the door on your way out. The robber was so startled and frightened. Later, the robber told people, I've been robbing for many years and have faced countless dangers, but I have never been as terrified as I was then. When asked what scared him, the robber replied, the monk's calm and composed demeanor completely overwhelmed me and left me petrified. 95. Eliminating Arrogance and Delusional Thoughts Often people's arrogance is merely an attempt to impress others through fake words and actions. If one can control the habit of showing off and maintain integrity, true respect can be achieved. Our desires, thoughts, and emotions are often wild dreams. If we can clear away these aimless thoughts, our souls can truly shine. In Buddhist teachings, there's a story about three followers who asked Zen master Wu Dewai, despite following Buddhism for many years, they still didn't feel happy. Master Wu De replied, Being happy isn't hard, but first you need to understand why you live. The followers admitted they didn't know, and Master Wu Dei remarked, No wonder you're not happy. Life without ideals, beliefs, and responsibilities can be very exhausting. The followers disagreed, saying, Ideals and beliefs sound nice, but they don't put food on the table. Master Wu Dei then asked, What do you think will make you happy? The first person said, Having honor makes everything joyful. The second person claimed, only love can bring happiness. The third person believed, money is the key to happiness. Master Wu Dei challenged them. Why then do some people with honor feel sad? Those in love experience pain, and those with money still worry. The followers were at a loss for words. Master Wu Dei concluded, if you can clear away the unnecessary thoughts in your head, your true nature will emerge and only then can you experience true happiness. 96. It's easier to cure diseases than to overcome personal demons. The negative effects of indulging in desires can be treated, but the damage caused by stubborn and incorrect reasoning is hardest to heal. Obstacles created by external factors in the world can be removed easily but those formed by deep-seated beliefs and convictions are the most challenging to eliminate. During the spring and autumn period when meeting Duke Tai of Chen, Bian Kui warned, you have a minor skin condition, and if not treated, it might become harmful. 
Duke Tai responded, I am not sick. After Bian Kui left, Duke Tai remarked, Doctors always like to treat those who aren't sick to make a name for themselves. Ten days later, Bian Kui returned and told Duke Tai, Your illness has now reached deeper into your flesh, and it could get worse if not treated. Duke Tai still ignored the advice. After Bian Kui left, Duke Tai was visibly upset. Another ten days passed and Bian Kui told him, Now the disease has reached your stomach, and if untreated, it will go deeper. Duke Tai still paid no heed. Ten days later from a distance, Bian Kui saw Duke Tai and immediately turned to flee. Duke Tai sent people to chase after him and ask why. Bian Kui explained, Duke Tai's condition is now beyond treatment. After saying this, Bian Kui fled from the state of Chen to the state of Qin. Due to Duke Tai's stubborn and incorrect perspective, he ultimately brought about his own demise. 97. The way to transcendence must be found in everyday life. To understand one's true nature, one must explore within oneself. The extraordinary method to rise above worldly desires can be found in everyday life. There is no need to exert oneself to completely cut off from society or flee to the forests and mountains. Understanding one's true self involves realizing that it's not necessary to sever all desires, allowing the heart to become calm like cooled ashes. Wang Quin, a military officer during the Ming Dynasty, was demoted for five years due to false accusations. During this period, he became aware of the darker side of human nature, which prompted him to retire and live in seclusion. His son built a private garden at their family home, planting many bamboo and rice plants, and included rockeries with water features next to the quiet surroundings of the mountains. After moving back, Wang Quin spent his days in this garden, enjoying a serene and independent country life. When asked why he didn't follow the ancient sages who secluded themselves in the mountains, Wang Quin replied, The greater seclusion is living unnoticed in the city. The lesser seclusion is withdrawing to the mountains. To truly transcend worldly concerns, one does not need to escape to the mountains. It is possible to cut off desires and quiet the mind while living amidst society. 98. As a government official, one must know restraint and not be arrogant upon returning to one's hometown. People in government who read a lot should control how they handle recommendations and avoid being easily approached by those seeking favors or positions to guard against opportunists. When retiring to the countryside, they should not act superior or arrogant. This helps maintain good relationships with family and clan members by being approachable and friendly. Liu Ji, a renowned advisor during the founding of the Ming Dynasty, was well-versed in classics and particularly in astronomy. He supported the founder of the Ming, Zhu Yuanzhang, in stabilizing the realm and was highly respected, though his strong character often led to conflicts and he was feared for his readiness to report any misdeeds to the prince, according to the law. Later, Liu Ji retired to live in seclusion in the mountains, spending his days drinking wine and playing chess, never boasting about his past achievements, and living harmoniously with the locals. When a local official sought him out, he initially refused to meet. The official then visited in disguise as a commoner. Liu Ji, who was washing his feet at the time, had his nephew invite the official in for a simple meal. Only then did the official reveal his identity. Surprised, Liu Ji quickly apologized and excused himself, and they never met again. 99. Know when to stop. It's truly admirable to see someone leave a fun dance party while still having a great time, without any regrets. These people know exactly when to let go. It's quite funny to see others who can't stop roaming around at night, continuously seeking entertainment, only to drown in their own miseries. 
During the Warring States period in ancient China, King Bin of the Jin State was seriously ill. Despite inviting famous doctors from all over the country, no one could cure him. Then he called on Dr. Yi He from the Qin State. Yi, he did not rush to prescribe any medicine but asked King Bin, Do you like to drink alcohol? King Bin replied, I love it, especially the strong ones. Yi, he further inquired, When do you usually drink? King Bin said, Mostly in the evenings with my wives and dancing girls. I can drink for a long time without getting drunk and enjoy myself without getting tired. Yi. He then explained, This is precisely your problem. Just as music has five tones, each with its intensity and playing the wrong tone can disrupt the music, humans have five organs, each with its functions and limits. Exceeding these limits can lead to illness. 100. The Rise and Fall of General Heluat Kuang, A Tale of Prosperity, Warning, and Tragedy When everything is at its peak, decline is inevitable, and during peaceful times, one should think about potential hardships. Every downfall often has its roots hidden within periods of prosperity. The robust life of plants begins in the decay of seasons. Therefore, wise people, when in favorable circumstances, should prepare for possible disasters before they strike, and when faced with adversity, they must remain resolute and determined to succeed. A notable general from the Northern Qi Dynasty during the Northern and Southern Dynasties, He Luat Kuang, was strict and upright. He managed his troops carefully and led them powerfully in frontline battles. Over many years, he commanded his forces in numerous battles against Northern Zhou, never facing defeat and achieving great honors. Consequently, he was promoted to a high-ranking general and served as the prime minister. He had a daughter who became the empress, two other daughters who married the crown prince, and three sons who married princesses, all of whom were granted noble ranks and positions, reaching a peak of glory at one time. However, he Luat Kuang understood the principle that what flourishes must eventually decline and what reaches an extreme must reverse. He warned his sons, throughout history, no family has ever maintained long-term glory based solely on the power of daughters. Be cautious. Despite his advice, his sons did not heed his warnings. Eventually, due to slander and conspiracy by deceitful people, he Luat Kuang was falsely accused of rebellion. The then emperor of Northern Qi deceitfully rewarded him with a fine horse and invited him to visit Dong San the next day, only to lure him into the palace and assassinate him, followed by the execution of his entire family. 101. Yi Yin, The Sage's Mission to Enlighten and Reform Understanding oneself through oneself can unleash the full potential of everything. Only those who understand themselves through their own nature can fully utilize the inherent capabilities of all things, and only those who can return the world to its natural state can truly transcend worldly concerns. Yi Yin was a wise man during the era of King Tang of the Shang Dynasty. Initially, he lived in the wilderness on the frontier of the Qin State, now part of Shandong Province, China, self-sufficiently farming and nourishing himself while joyfully following the teachings of Ngiyu and Thuan, focusing on personal and spiritual cultivation. King Tang sent gifts to Yi Yin several times, but Yi Yin consistently declined them. Eventually, Yi Yin changed his approach. He stated, Heaven creates and nurtures humans, and like a sage among them, it is my duty to enlighten the backward. As one of these sages, I must use the teachings of Nihiyu and Thuan to awaken our people. If I do not take up this responsibility, who will? According to Yi Yin, if even one person in the world has not been influenced by the teachings of Nihiyu and Thuan, it is as if he has pushed them into an abyss.
Therefore, he took it upon himself to educate and uplift the world. He actively went to the Shang court to assist King Tang in disciplining King Ji of the Xia dynasty, thus saving the people and fulfilling his mission. As a sage among the people, it is my duty to strive to reform the world. 102. From Recklessness to Redemption, The Transformative Journey of Chu So it's not shameful to make mistakes, but it is worrying when a person doesn't recognize their own errors. For example, a wild horse galloping freely across the grasslands can be tamed and trained by humans to become a useful workhorse. Similarly, people who live recklessly without any ambition will never achieve success. Therefore, a wise man named Bach Sa once said, Having many faults is not shameful but going through life blind to one's own faults is truly worrisome. There was a brave and reckless young man named Chu So during the Western Jin Dynasty, who was considered a major menace in his region. In Nia Hung, there were two other threats, a fierce river creature and a tiger on the mountain. Together, they caused great trouble for the locals, who called them the Three Calamities, with Chu So being the worst. Encouraged to eliminate these threats, Chu So killed the tiger and then battled the river creature. This fight lasted three days and nights. People assumed he had died and even started celebrating. However, Chu So managed to defeat the river creature and emerged from the water alive. Realizing the villagers saw him as a disaster too, he decided to change his ways. Someone advised him, As long as you have a clear purpose, and determination. Why worry about leaving a bad legacy? Inspired by these words, Chu So reformed himself and eventually became a respected historical figure. 103. Observing calmly, judging wisely. Stay quiet to observe others, listen carefully to what people say, feel the surroundings calmly, and think things through clearly. During the spring and autumn period, the great educator Confucius had a student named Zheng Shen. In Zheng Shen's hometown, there was another man with the same name. One day, it was reported that Zheng Shen from the outskirts had committed murder. The news, Zheng Shen has killed someone, quickly spread throughout his hometown. A neighbor told Zheng Shen's parents, Zheng Shen has killed someone, but Zheng's mother didn't believe it. Soon, another person came and told his mother, Zheng Shen really did kill someone. She still didn't pay any attention. Later, a third person came and said, It's all over town now. Everyone is saying that it was definitely Zheng Shen who killed someone. At this point, Zheng's mother started to worry. She feared that if the murder was linked to her son, it could endanger their relatives so she could no longer ignore it. She decided to find out the truth about her son, hurriedly locked the garden gate, grabbed a ladder, climbed over the wall, and fled to a deserted area. This fable teaches us to rely on accurate information, analyze situations wisely, and handle matters rationally. 104. Happiness and Misfortune – Only a Thought Apart Happiness and misfortune in life are both created by our desires. Therefore, Buddha once said, Excessive craving for fame and gain leads to ruin, and being overly attached to greed, hatred, and desire leads to suffering. Enlightenment can liberate us from suffering and lead to peace. Our mindset influences our experiences, so we must be very careful. During the Warring States period near the northern border, there was an old man named Tai Gong. He owned many horses, and one day, one of his horses ran away. Instead of being upset, Tai Gong said, Losing one horse is not a big loss. Who knows what good fortune it may bring? A few days later, not only did the lost horse return, but it also brought back another fine horse from the Xiongnu tribe. His neighbors congratulated Tai Gong, saying, Your horse has not only returned, but has also brought another horse. What a blessing! However, 
Tai Gong, rather than being pleased, was worried and said, Suddenly, gaining a horse might not be lucky. It could bring more trouble. Tai Gong had an only son who loved horses. One day, he fell off the back of the Xiong new horse and broke his leg. Tai Gong said, It's okay. A broken leg but a life spared can still be considered fortunate. Not long after, when the Xiong new army invaded and drafted all able-bodied young men, most of the conscripts were killed in battle. However, because Tai Gong's son had a broken leg, he was spared from conscription and his life was saved. 105. When your soul and body are radiant, you cannot lose your true essence. People who boast about their achievements or show off their poetry are often those who rely on material things and external influences. They fail to realize that by maintaining a pure and untainted soul, without losing their natural disposition, they can be true to themselves even without any accomplishments or creations. During the Qing dynasty, there was a poor farmer who was always cheerful in his work, whether it was repairing bridges, plowing fields, or farming. His good deeds were countless. At the age of 70, while selling brooms in town, he found a gold bar on the roadside. After finding the owner who had dropped it, he immediately returned the gold. The owner, overwhelmed with gratitude, fell to his knees and profusely thanked the old man, even offering him a string of coins as a reward. The owner explained that the gold was entrusted to him by Mr. Zhang to deliver to his father-in-law, and losing it would have endangered the lives of his entire family. The old man refused to take any money, simply advising the young man to be more careful in the future. After tightening his belt, he picked up his bundle of brooms, leaned on his walking stick, and walked away. The gold owner chased after him, asking for his name. He smiled and said, I am Lao Ren from Xuan Dai. Since then, the story of Xuan Dai Lao Ren finding gold and not being greedy has been passed down through generations. 106. Wisdom and Leadership The Tale of Emperor Taizong and Wei Zhong's Honest Counsel. Effective medicine tastes bitter, and true words may sound unpleasant. People often hear things that upset them and experience situations they don't enjoy. These are ways to improve and develop one's character. If one only hears pleasing words and encounters agreeable situations, they might live their life engulfed in the deceptive comfort of bliss. In history, Emperor Taizong of Tang, also known as Li Ximin, was a wise and compassionate ruler who welcomed honest criticism. Wei Zheng, an advisor known for his integrity, often courageously spoke the truth, even if it displeased the emperor. During a heated debate in court, Taizong, angered, exclaimed, One day I might kill Wei Zheng. He constantly embarrasses me in front of others. How can I tolerate it? Hearing this, Empress Zhang Sun said nothing at the moment, but later changed into her formal court dress and paid a respectful visit to Emperor Taizong. Surprised, he asked, What is this for? The Empress responded, I heard that a wise emperor is blessed with honest officials. Shouldn't I congratulate your majesty for this? Her words acted like a splash of cold water, calming the emperor's anger and frustration. Instead of resenting Wei Zheng, Taizong later praised him, acknowledging that just like bitter medicine cures ailments, Wei Zheng's frankness, though unpleasant, was truly valuable. 107. Reflection and Regret Lessons from Ancient Wisdom on Preserving Our True Nature Reflecting on and regretting past actions after they've happened can help us avoid blind folly in the present, thus preserving our true nature. For example, after a full meal, it's hard to appreciate the delicious taste of gourmet food. Similarly, after satisfying sexual desires, dwelling on immoral thoughts won't stir further desire. 
Thus, if one acknowledges their mistakes and overcomes immediate passions, they can maintain their true self and act with consistent principles without losing their way. During the Warring States period in the state of So, there was a high official named Zhang Tan. One day, he warned King Xiang of So about the perils of indulging in excess with the people in his court, neglecting the affairs of the state. The king didn't like hearing this. Zhang Tan further cautioned that if the king continued to heed these corrupt advisors, the state of So would surely perish. When the king disbelieved him, Zhang Tan asked to leave for the state of Zhao to avoid the impending disaster. Not long after he left, the state of Qin invaded So. King Xiang, forced into exile, finally realized that Zhang Tan was right and hurriedly sent for him. Zhang Tan responded, It's too late to think of hunting dogs when the rabbit is already gone. Similarly, it's too late to build a pen after the cow is lost. At this point, King Xiang truly understood. If he had reflected earlier, he wouldn't have ended up defeated and exiled. Similarly, in life, if you can awaken and discard foolish passions and reflect upon past actions to guide future ones, it's better than scrambling to fix things after the fact. This understanding marks a significant advancement in grasping the lessons of life. 108. Review Initial Intentions. Observe Final Outcomes. For those who fail and face extreme difficulties in their careers, we should empathize with their initial intentions to strive for success. For those who are successful and have fulfilled careers, we should observe how they manage their paths, moving forward to see if they can maintain their success until the end of their lives. Zhuan Vu Kun was a famous comedian from the state of Qi during the Warring States period, and he was known for his love of drinking. One day, King Qi Wei asked him how much he could drink. Zhuan Vu Kun replied, If the king gifts me wine, but there is a senior official enforcing laws beside me and a royal historian ready to accuse me behind my back, then I would be so frightened that just one pot would make me drunk. If it's during a banquet in the streets where men and women sit together, passing drinks and playing drinking games, laughing and talking, then I would feel relaxed and could drink up to eight pots. If it's at night, with men and women in the same bed, dishes scattered around, wearing short clothes and the scent of female guests filling the air, then in such a joyful moment, I could finish an entire jar. After drinking, I wouldn't remember what I had done. Someone said, excessive drinking leads to chaos. Extreme joy can bring sorrow. When one's career is at its peak, they should think about how to maintain it for life. Hearing this, King Qi Wei realized that Zhuan Vu Kun was advising him not to indulge in endless revelries that could ruin his governance, and so he ended all such nightly feasts. 109. Forging steel in a dark room, facing a precipice on thin ice. True loyalty shines like the sun and is nurtured in the darkest of places. Much like a leaky room symbolizes hardship that goes unnoticed. Courage capable of transforming the world is developed when facing deep abysses and treacherous ice, representing a careful and thoughtful approach to handling situations. Han Fei and Shunzi were prominent philosophers during the Warring States period. One day, Han Fei asked Shunzi, These days, everyone is discussing the topic of steadfastness and strong character. What are your thoughts on this issue? Shunzi replied, Your point is very valid. A good horse may leap far in one bound, but only by a few steps. A poor horse, if it keeps running without stopping, can eventually cover a great distance. If you carve a piece of wood and stop halfway, even rotten wood is hard to finish carving. But if you keep carving without rest, even metal and stone can be sculpted into flowers. Have you seen an earthworm? It lacks teeth and claws and doesn't have strong muscles, yet it can move through the earth up 
and down. Have you seen a crab? It may have a sturdy shell, eight legs, and two strong claws, but without a ready burrow, it too lacks a safe place to rest. 110. High rank brings danger. High virtue attracts criticism. It's not wise to have a very high and prominent position or wealth, as it can be very dangerous. Skills and capabilities should not be used to their full extent, as using them fully can lead to deterioration. Speaking too arrogantly can lead to harmful gossip and criticism. During the spring and autumn period, Meng Jianzi served as a general in the states of Liang and Wei, but had to flee to the state of Qi due to offenses. Guan Zhong welcomed him and asked, You were once a high-ranking general in Liang and Wei. How did you come to offend others so quickly? Meng Jianzi replied, Ah, being too high in rank is dangerous and being too virtuous leads to criticism. Guan Zhong then asked, How many people came with you today? Meng Jianzi answered, Three people. Guan Zhong asked, Who are they? Meng Jianzi replied, One is a father whose son has died. He didn't have the strength to bury his son, so I helped him. Another is a mother whose son also died, and I helped her bury her son. The last is a brother who was unfortunately imprisoned, and I helped release him. These three people came with me. Guan Zhong welcomed Meng Jianzi onto his chariot and said, I do not rely on the warmth of spring to comfort people, nor the rains of summer to soothe their souls, for there will surely come a time when I face extreme difficulties. 111. When you're well off, remember the times of hardship, and when you're safe, think of times of danger. Living in wealth, you should understand the struggles of impoverished families, and when you are young and strong, you should care for the sufferings of the elderly who are frail. During the Western Han Dynasty, when the Xiongnu invaded the Central Plains, generals were ordered to mobilize. A famous general, Zhou Yaofu, was stationed at Teliu. One day, Emperor Han Wendi visited Teliu to inspect the troops, and the vanguard shouted, The Son of Heaven has arrived! However, the military gatekeeper replied, In the military camp we only follow the orders of our general, not the imperial edicts. With no other choice, Emperor Wendy had to send a messenger with the imperial seal to Zhou Yaofu, who then ordered the gates to be opened. Inside the camp, Zhou Yaofu, fully armed, met the emperor and declared, A soldier in uniform need not kneel before the emperor. At this, Emperor Wendy involuntarily straightened his robe solemnly. Later, Zhou Yao Fu was promoted several times, eventually becoming the prime minister, and was highly regarded by Emperor Han Jingdi. The emperor consulted with Zhou Yao Fu before making any major national decisions, and Zhou Yao Fu often opposed the emperor's actions when he disagreed. However, during peaceful times, Zhou Yaofu thought of potential dangers and was aware of the transient nature of his power. Concerned for his own life, he requested to resign due to illness, and Emperor Jingdi granted his request, relieving him of his duties. In suffering there is joy, and in joy there is suffering. When one is enduring hardships in pursuit of a career, the pursuit itself brings immense joy. Yet when one reaches the peak and stands before a valley, there often lies a hidden sorrow for not achieving as desired. Zhuangzi was a great thinker and philosopher during the Warring States period. Once, while Zhuangzi and a man named Hui Shi were walking over the Hao River Bridge, Zhuangzi saw fish swimming below and said to Hui Shi, Fish swim freely in the water without constraints, and this is their joy. Hui Shi mocked him. You are not a fish. How do you know their joy? Zhuangzi retorted. You are not me. How do you know that I do not know the joy of fish? Hui Shi was left speechless. In life, each of us faces various troubles, and knowing how to find happiness and sorrow is of great importance. 
112. Strategic Retreat Wisdom from the Spring and Autumn Period Anyone who enjoys life should think of troubles during good times and plan for a way out when advancing in life. It's necessary to prepare an exit strategy when moving up the ladder to avoid being stuck between a rock and a hard place. When things are going well, consider when to stop to avoid the dangers of riding the tiger. During the spring and autumn period, King Hilu of Wu destroyed Chu and Zhao, reaching a peak of power. Hilu sent an envoy to the state of Qi to propose marrying the daughter of Duke Jing of Qi for his heir, Prince Bo. Duke Jing reluctantly agreed, crying as he sent his daughter to Wu. One of Duke Jing's advisors, Cao Mengzi, advised, Our state Qi, backed by the sea and protected by rivers and mountains, might not conquer the whole world but remains unconquerable. If you cannot bear to be apart from your daughter, don't marry her off. Duke Jing replied, The ancients said, Live in peace but think of danger, advance thinking of retreat. If we don't comply with WU's request now, disaster will inevitably follow and we will be backed into a corner. There's a saying, if you can't command others, better to follow their orders. Being unable to command is due to not finding the right opportunity. Since the time is not right, it's wise to retreat and obey. 113. When practicing spiritual disciplines, it's important to disconnect from worldly matters. Once you've understood the path, you should engage with secular issues. If you're struggling to control your thoughts and emotions, you should distance yourself from the noise and distractions of daily life. This helps prevent your mind from being misled by desires, allowing you to remain clear-headed and recognize your true pure nature. When your virtues are strong and stable, you should live among worldly temptations, allowing your mind to face and resist these desires without confusion. This way, you can develop sharpness, flexibility, and insight. The renowned general Yue Fei from the Southern Song Dynasty showed great promise and honesty from a young age. As a boy, he could pull a bow that weighed over 300 pounds and handle a heavy crossbow. His parents sent him to learn archery from Zhou Tong. Yue Fei was very smart and quickly mastered all the techniques taught by Zhou Tong, becoming an excellent archer. After Zhou Tong's death, Yue Fei would visit his grave on the 1st and 15th of each month to pay his respects. His father believed this was very honorable and said, if you and he were properly recognized in society, you could truly dedicate yourself to the country for a just cause. To instill in him a goal of utmost loyalty to the nation and to restore the Song dynasty, Yue Fei's mother engraved the words, utmost loyalty to the nation, on his back. As an adult, Yue Fei passionately served the Southern Song dynasty in their resistance against the Jin dynasty eventually becoming a celebrated and strategic military leader. 114. Moderation and Balance – Timeless Virtues for Harmonious Living The virtues of a gentleman are centered on moderation and balance. Being honest and generously tolerant, kind yet decisive, understanding everything but not harsh on others, and straightforward without being fake. If one can maintain this balance, like candy made from sugar but not overly sweet, or like seawater containing salt but not overly salty, then this is a noble quality. Historically, Confucian scholars have advocated for moderation, but interpretations of what moderation entails can vary. During the Warring States period, a scholar who studied the works of Shen Nong argued that prices in the market should all be the same to ensure social fairness and eliminate deception. Mencius disagreed, saying, Following this idea leads to dishonesty. Because goods vary in quality, their prices should naturally differ significantly, sometimes by ten or even a hundredfold. A price that does not match the quality of goods disrupts the natural order, 
having the same price for different goods is inappropriate. If we insist on uniform pricing, it would lead to chaos. Similarly, with human actions or choices, going beyond limits causes disorder, ruins tasks, and leads to punishment. Overeating harms the body. Excessive indulgence leads to the loss of one state. Greed can bring disaster. And too much joking can damage relationships, sometimes even unintentionally causing hostility. 115. Indifferent to glory and disgrace, moving forward without concern. Whether in times of glory or disgrace, he remains unaffected, simply enjoying the blossoming and fading of flowers in his yard. Whether promoted or demoted, he just freely watches the clouds roll across the sky. One day, Mencius was prepared to meet King Ki, but at that moment King Ki sent a message saying he was too ill to meet outside and asked Mencius to come to the palace instead. Mencius felt this was a slight against him and told the messenger, Unfortunately, I am also ill and cannot come to meet him. The next day, Mencius was supposed to visit Dr. Dong Kwok's house to pay his respects. As soon as Mencius left, King Ki sent someone to inquire about his health. Mencius's brother, Meng Zhongzi, replied, Yesterday, the king invited him to court, but he was too ill to go. Today, he recovered a bit and has gone to the court, but I'm not sure if he has arrived yet. After King Ki's messenger left, Meng Zhongzi sent someone to intercept Mencius, urging him not to return home but to go meet King Qi quickly. Mencius did not go but spent the night at his friend Jing Xu's house. Jing Xu asked Mencius, The king wanted to meet you and you didn't go. Isn't that disrespectful? It's also not proper. Mencius replied, Oh, what are you saying? I never desired riches or honors from him, nor did I seek even half a position of power. I was never moved by favors or disgrace, not clinging to retirement or official duties. So why should I feel obliged to meet him? 116. In personal conduct, do not be hasty or thoughtless. In thinking, avoid being stubborn. A virtuous person who is well cultivated should know themselves and maintain their character without being impulsive or easily disturbed by external influences, which could cause them to lose their calm and peaceful interest. In thinking, being too stubborn can lead to being constrained by external factors, thus losing natural vitality. Two Ha guests from the Ming dynasty enjoyed traveling. One day he got on a small boat his mother brought him to and said, Mom, you often ask where my ambition lies. Today please come and see for yourself. After saying this, he rowed the boat into the river, and the beautiful riverscape gradually unfolded before his mother's eyes. Seeing his mother's mood become very cheerful, Tu Ha Guest said, This is just the beginning. There are more beautiful and moving scenes ahead. Soon the small boat entered a river gorge, and the scenery became even more spectacular, with lush mountains and clear waters captivating his mother completely. At that moment, Tu Ha Guest told his mother, My ambition lies in the mountains and rivers of our country, not in the path of becoming an official. If you insist I follow that path, I will lose my vitality, so I cannot pursue it according to your wishes. Please forgive me. His mother said, The ancients said, A cultivated gentleman must understand himself. Since you do not care for the official path but cherish the mountains and rivers, then follow your dreams. 117. People die for their legacy. Tigers die for their skin. Spring brings warm sunlight and breezes making flowers, plants, and trees beautifully bloom and enhancing the natural scenery while birds in the forest begin to sing. If a person who reads books works hard and has more luck than others, they can live comfortably with enough food and warm clothing. 
If they don't think about writing timeless literature or doing good deeds for the world, even if they live to be a hundred, it's as if they never lived a day on this earth. During the Five Dynasties period, among the followers of Emperor Liang was a famous general named Wang Yanzhang. As a young man, he fought many battles alongside the emperor and achieved great merits. After the emperor's death, he helped to stabilize the empire for his successors, a significant achievement. However, after Wang Yanzhang suffered two consecutive defeats in battles against the later Tang, those who had always resented him seized the opportunity to slander him to the last emperor of Liang, resulting in his dismissal from military power. Within half a year, the empire became unstable, and Wang Yanzhang was asked to return. Once, when Wang Yanzhang was captured by the Tang forces, the Tang emperor admired him greatly and wanted him to become one of his generals. Wang Yanzhang said, How can someone serve as a general for one country in the morning and work for another by evening? So he asked the emperor for a sword, expressing no resentment but only gratitude for the honor. Ultimately, he died but left behind an enduring legacy of honor. 118. Selfish desires can cause irreversible damage. Whenever people allow themselves to be driven by personal gain, they can shift from being upright to weak, from intelligent to foolish, from kind to cruel, and from noble to corrupted. Such desires can harm a person's character for a lifetime. Therefore, ancient wisdom teaches that avoiding selfish desires is a noble trait for personal development, helping one live free from worldly cravings. During chaotic times, scholar Hua Hong went out on a hot day and felt extremely thirsty. He noticed a pear tree by the road where passersby were picking fruits. Unlike others, Hua Hang refrained. When asked why he didn't pick a pear to quench his thirst, he replied, If it's not mine, how can I just take it? Someone laughed at him for being old-fashioned and said, In such chaotic times, why worry about whose pears they are? Hua Hong solemnly said, The pears might be ownerless, but my conscience is not. Having a conscience and seeking personal gain are completely contrasting attitudes. The outcome of the former is a lasting purity of spirit, while the latter leads to eternal regret. In life, some maintain their principles and integrity, avoiding distractions and temptations, unaffected by material things, and not suffering for fame or profit. Others chase after these, engage in corrupt activities, or end up regretting their choices, sometimes even facing imprisonment. 119. Self-improvement is the beginning of a great career. Staying true to one's conscience, adhering to common human decency, and not wasting resources, achieving these three things can foster a good nature in the world, create a better life for the people, and bring blessings to future generations. Two years after defeating the Shang Dynasty, King Wu of the Western Zhou passed away in Kaojing, and King Cheng, who was still a child, succeeded him. As King Wu lay dying, he entrusted his brother, the Duke of Zhou, to help govern. The Duke of Zhou took on the task of building a new state, handling numerous affairs daily. He implemented policies to enslave war prisoners, banned alcohol, imposed sanctions on smaller neighboring countries, and suppressed forces loyal to the Shang dynasty, all while ensuring the welfare of the nobility and descendants of the Shang dynasty. These measures all contributed to social stability and the prosperity and development of the nation. The Duke of Zhou believed that caring for the people was his duty. Once, while he was bathing, a visitor arrived. He met the visitor with wet hair, then returned to his bath, repeating this process three times during one bath because he had to greet three separate visitors. Sometimes, he barely started eating a bite of rice when someone came to see him, causing him to spit out his food to attend to them. Hence, 
historical records say, the Duke of Zhou spat out his rice, and the world turned their hearts to him, and later generations regarded him as a sage. 120. Life is full of ups and downs, and patience is our shield. There's a saying, Climbing a mountain requires patience at the steep and dangerous parts, and walking on snow requires caution on the precarious bridges. The deeper meaning of patience here is likened to the silent fears within us, the unpredictable twists of fate. Without this patience, it's almost inevitable to fall into perilous depths. In the early Western Han Dynasty, a famous military leader named Han Xin endured a life of extreme hardship before gaining fame. A young man from his village, Hawaii, insulted Han Xin by saying, Although you are tall and carry a sword, you are really just a coward. Later, another local taunted him. If you are not afraid of death, then stab me with your sword. If you are scared, kneel down and let me sit on you. After careful thought, Han Xin chose to kneel. People on the streets laughed at him, calling him a coward. Years later, when Han Xin became the king of Qi, he remembered these insults. He found the man who had humiliated him and made him a lieutenant, telling his officers, This is a brave man. When he insulted me, didn't I want to kill him? But killing him would have been pointless, so I chose to endure the humiliation for a moment, to achieve great success later on. 121. Harmony and Wisdom, A Tale of Humanity and Righteousness in Ancient Philosophies Humans are a reflection of the natural world, and nature is like a parent to us. Our bodies are a small universe. If we get too excited or happy, we shouldn't exceed certain limits. Managing our desires according to some principles is a true skill of human harmony. Nature, like a parent to humanity, should ideally keep us from feeling resentful or complaining. If natural disasters or fires don't disrupt everything, then we can experience peace and tranquility. When Mencius met King Hui of Liang, the king said, You've traveled thousands of miles to see me. You must have some advice that could benefit the state of Liang. Mencius replied, Why do you seek benefit? Just being humane and righteous is enough. For Mencius, humanity and benefit are contradictory and cannot coexist. However, Zhunzi, another Confucian thinker, disagreed. He believed in merging righteousness with benefit. Zhunzi understood people better than Mencius because his ideas were practical, reasonable, and easier for people to implement. Zhunzi said, both righteousness and benefit are necessary for everyone. Advocates of righteousness should not hide their pursuit of benefit, and those pursuing benefit should not abandon righteousness. Talking about righteousness while earning money is the way to live fully. A noble person may seek wealth, but must do so ethically. To pursue profit and ignore righteousness is surely despicable. Therefore, a wise person should act according to the true way. 122. Reputation and Joy Avoid Greed People who often host feasts and parties aren't typically very serious or respectable. Those who enjoy wasteful partying and dancing aren't considered honest, noble individuals. And those who extremely value their social standing aren't really good role models. During the Tang Dynasty, one day Emperor Taizong, also known as Li Ximin, was discussing historical and current events with his top officials. He shared a humorous story. Long ago, there was a merchant who acquired a rare and valuable gem. To prevent it from being stolen, he decided to hide it inside his stomach by cutting himself open, which resulted in his death soon after. There was also a high-ranking official who took bribes without fearing the law, and a ruler who indulged in pleasures without worrying about losing his kingdom. They were all as foolish as the merchant who hid the gem in his stomach. We must use this story as a reminder to ourselves not to follow in their footsteps.
The officials all nodded in agreement after hearing this. 123. Don't underestimate yourself, but don't brag either. There's an old saying, some people ignore their own precious assets and throw them aside only to mimic the poor who have nothing and go from house to house begging. Another saying goes, poor people who suddenly become rich should not speak pompously, for isn't every chimney bound to gather some soot? The first quote advises people not to undervalue themselves, while the second advises against boasting. Both situations aim to teach people to learn from these experiences. A famous general from the state of Qi, Tianji, was fond of horse racing. Once, he arranged a race with King Wu of Qi. The final races of previous years often involved these two competitors. Tianji usually lost to King Wu. Considering the competition in this race, the well-known military strategist of the time, Sun Bin, also attended. He compared the horses of Tianji and King Wu. He noted that their leg strength was quite similar, but horses could be categorized into three levels, top, middle, and bottom. He suggested to Tianji, you can use your bottom-level horse against the king's top-level horse, your top-level horse against his middle-level horse, and your middle-level horse against his bottom-level horse. The race ended with Tianji losing one race but winning two, ultimately winning a thousand gold pieces from King Wu. 124. Overcoming Misunderstandings, a Lesson in Perception and Peace Being overly suspicious and jealous often leads to trouble, while not worrying is a blessing. The greatest happiness in life is not to fret over unnecessary things, and the greatest disaster is to harbor too much envy and resentment. Only those who are busy with daily struggles can appreciate the joy of peace and quiet, and only those who maintain a calm and steady mind can understand the disasters caused by suspicion and resentment. During the Eastern Han Dynasty, a man named Ying Sam invited his friend Du Xuan for a drink. The gathering was held in a large room, and on the north wall there hung a red bow. Due to light refraction, the shadow of the bow appeared in Du Xuan's drink. Mistaking it for a snake wriggling in his glass, Du Xuan broke into a cold sweat. Despite his fears, he didn't want to refuse his host's kindness and took a sip. When he got home, Du Xuan became increasingly convinced that he had drunk a snake in his wine, leading him to fall ill. His family quickly called a doctor, but even after taking many medicines, his condition did not improve. A few days later, Ying Sam visited Du Xuan to find out why he was so gravely ill. Du Xuan then shared the incident about the snake in his drink. Ying Sam realized the misunderstanding caused by the bow's reflection on the glass. He took Du Xuan back to the same spot and asked him to observe the image in the glass carefully, then explained, The snake you saw in your drink was merely the reflection of the bow on the wall, caused by your excessive worry. Once Du Xuan understood the situation, his doubts and worries disappeared, and he quickly recovered from his illness. 125. Promoting Enlightenment. Always stay alert. When you feel mentally disorganized and unfocused, you should clear your mind to become alert and calm. When feeling stressed, it's important to relax your mind. Failing to manage your emotions properly can lead to mistakes, causing confusion and panic. Confucius served as the Minister of Justice in the state of Lu, equivalent to a modern-day justice minister, and though his travels to other states were challenging, he maintained relationships with kings and peers. Later, as a teacher, he was highly respected. His students likened him to the sun and the moon, but Confucius disagreed, saying, In a small village with ten households, there could be someone like me. They just aren't as dedicated to learning. He also remarked, some call me a sage and a benevolent man, but how can I deserve such titles? I am just a tireless teacher.
This attitude kept him and his students in good spirits. Once, when visiting Wu City, where his student Zi Lu was the magistrate, he heard music and jokingly said, Ha ha, using a butcher knife to kill a chicken? This meant that such a small place did not require elaborate ceremonial education. Zi Lu replied, Previously, you said that educated officials are compassionate and educated people are easier to lead, right? Confucius confirmed, Yes, I was just joking with my students. 126. Keeping Cool Under Pressure A Humorous Encounter in the Qing Dynasty's Royal Study Be genuine and fair in your dealings. Without a sincere heart, a person can become superficial and insincere in everything they do. Without flexibility, they can become dull and face obstacles everywhere. A high-ranking official in the Qing dynasty, who was overweight and disliked the heat, would sweat profusely during summer days, soaking his clothes. He often undressed to cool off in the southern study room. Emperor Qianlong, aware of this, visited the southern study to tease him. At that time, the official and a friend were shirtless and laughing, not noticing Qianlong in time to cover up. The official, being nearsighted, did not recognize the emperor until it was too late and quickly lay down on the bed, breathless and afraid to move. Qianlong intentionally delayed leaving. Impatient, the official peeked out and asked, Has the old man left yet? This made Qianlong and everyone else laugh. Qianlong said, How disrespectful. What do you mean by old man? Explain yourself or face punishment. The official apologized profusely, saying, Old refers to the venerable and eternal. Head means the one who holds up the sky. And son refers to the offspring of heaven and earth. Qianlong was pleased by the explanation. 127. The Transformation of Tao Kao Sin, Trust and Redemption Trusting people means you are honest. Suspecting them means you are deceitful. When a person trusts others, it might be that those others are not honest, but the trusting person themselves will be honest, whereas someone who suspects others might find that those others are not deceitful, but they themselves will end up being deceitful. During the Western Han Dynasty, the governor of Hadong Kwai Bo was highly valued and committed to fulfilling his promises. He had a fellow countryman named Tao Kao Sin, who was known for being dishonest and deceitful, and had often been scolded and criticized by Kui Bo. Later, Tao Kao Sin approached Kui Bo, saying, I want to repent and become a new person, but I'm afraid others won't trust me. Someone said, being trusted by Kui Bo is worth more than a thousand pieces of gold, so I came to see you. Please, from now on, accept my actions so that I can earn a good reputation. Kui Bo, seeing his sincere attitude, agreed. From then on, regardless of what Tao Kao Sin said or did, Kui Bo never doubted him. Tao Kao Sin eventually stopped lying and deceiving others, completely changing his ways and becoming a respected scholar for the rest of his life. 128. Perseverance and Justice in Ancient Governance Persistent effort will lead to success. Just as a rope can saw through wood if used continuously, and water can carve through rock if it flows long enough, a person who understands truth must diligently work hard and persevere. Over time, water will create channels, and a ripe melon will naturally fall from the vine. A person who fully grasps truth by their innate nature will surely succeed. During the rule of Emperor Triu Tong, Truong Tua Nha served as a district magistrate in Sung Duong. At that time, it was common for soldiers to disrespect their generals and lower-ranking officials to insult their superiors. Truong Thua Nha decided this was unacceptable and was determined to reform this situation. One day, while patrolling the district office, 
he suddenly saw a low-ranking official running panicked from the storeroom. Truong Tua NHA called him over and found a coin hidden under his headscarf. The official hesitantly admitted to stealing from the storeroom after much evasion. Truong Tua NHA took him to the public court for an inquiry. The official defiantly said, It's just one coin. You can beat me, but you can't kill me. Angered by his attitude, Truong Thua NHA declared, One coin a day, a thousand coins in a thousand days, time is long and wide. To punish this misconduct, Truong Thua NHA ordered the execution of the official. Just 129. Fairness over favoritism. A lesson in leadership from Emperor Taizu of Song. Clearly distinguishing between merit and fault, avoid showing personal favor or spite. Achievements and mistakes must not be confused, as confusion can lead to laziness and a lack of ambition. Favor and spite should not be overly evident, as being too obvious can cause doubt and betrayal among people. During the Song Dynasty, there was an official who deserved a promotion according to the imperial court's regulations. However, Emperor Taizu of Song, Zhao Kuangyin, had a poor impression of this official and delayed his promotion. The Prime Minister, Zhao Pu, told Emperor Taizu, Merit serves as evidence, good or bad without basis. Decisions based solely on personal likes or dislikes often lead to errors. Emperor Taizu, angered, replied, I am the emperor. If I don't want to promote him, what can you do? Zhao Pu patiently explained, Since ancient times, punishment has been used to discipline and rewards to acknowledge merit as a matter of fairness. Punishment and rewards are the laws of the land, not personal tools of an emperor. How can your majesty let personal feelings override the nation's system? Realizing the truth in these words, Emperor Taizu agreed to follow the regulations and proceeded with the promotion. 130. Accept mistakes and share credit. It's important to take responsibility for mistakes and not just seek to share the credit for successes. Doing so avoids mistrust. You should help others overcome difficulties and not just enjoy the good times with them as this can lead to resentment. During the Warring States period in Vietnam, King Viet Vuong Cao Tien, with the help of his capable advisors Pham Lai and Van Chung, defeated the state of Ungo. After this victory, his troops crossed the Hoai River and met with other feudal lords in Tu Chau. Following this battle, his forces controlled the region along the Hoai River, and he was recognized as a hegemon by the other lords. After returning victorious, Cao Tien held a grand celebration to honor his supporters, but Pham Lai was notably absent. Legend has it that Pham Lai chose to disappear and flee to another country. Before leaving, he warned Van Chung with a letter saying, Now that all the birds have been shot, it's time to put away the good bows. Now that all the rabbits have been caught, it's time to cook the hunting dogs. You may have shared hard times with King Viet, but you can't share the good times, leave quickly. Van Chung didn't heed the warning and eventually met a tragic fate. 131. Preserving Success and Preventing Repeat Mistakes If you can't complete your career plans perfectly, Focus instead on maintaining the success you've already achieved with all your effort. Rather than regret past mistakes, put all your energy into preventing them from happening again. During the spring and autumn period, on his way to serve as an official in the state of Wei, ZC unexpectedly met a man from Wei fishing by the river. Soon after, the man caught a huge fish weighing over a hundred pounds. Z.C., amazed, asked, Catching such a fish is the hardest, as it doesn't like to bite bait. How did you manage to catch it? The man from Wei explained, When I cast the line, I used regular fish bait, which the big fish ignored and swam away from, but it didn't go far and kept swimming back and forth nearby. 
Then I switched to a piece of pork as bait, and the moment the big fish saw the tasty meat, it bit. That's how I caught it. Moved by the story, ZC remarked, Though hard to catch, the big fish died because of its greed for a large bait. The principle is somewhat similar to serving as an official. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom.